Well, good Tuesday morning to you and welcome to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you. That has been and is still Ayla Brooke and the Sound Men. And, uh, you know, we, we get uh, emails every once in a while. Well, I mean, every day. But what I mean is through the day. Basically we get, every day. I was going to say every once in a while. That's Sam G. Brooks, the senior producer, the technical producer of Real Talk, everybody. Um, I, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking we get emails on uh, who, who, is the mu- who is that music you play and who painted those pieces behind you? Every single day, through the day, and it's always our pleasure to put these artists on people's radar. It's, it's almost like we plan to use this space to show off artists. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've got a gallery space here. here. Yeah. Um, there's, there's some healthy competition shaping up, which I know because if you send an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com, it's going to go to Sam and me. That's the best way to get something on our radar uh, with respect, obviously, to the live YouTube comments, the Real Talk RJ hashtag, all the ways you can get in touch with us. They are fleeting. You know, if the hashtag starts trending, as it does a few times a week, typically at least, uh, th- that means that the tweets are there, but but of course they can get buried. And the, the live YouTube comments are amazing, but it's da 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 because there's so many of you tuned in right now. Yeah. Like, like, like can, I, can I just say, like, where, uh, where else on the internet? I'm serious. I, I'm Where else... On the internet, except for maybe like the the Ambleside Baptist Church or something like that, like the online community of people who gather in the spirit of community and fellowship, where it is a it's a friendly. Isn't that audience. what we do though? That is we what gather we do. In the spirit of and this is and people's church. But you know, I'm like, there's there's no one. I mean, you know, I'm not inviting it. I'm not trying to manifest it. Uh, but there's but there's nobody here this morning being like you know they're putting fluoride in our water and then the chemtrails are here and, 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 and you people aren't even smart enough to sort it out and all caps and no we we have Alex Jones book next week don't worry <laughs> I would have Alex Jones on the show <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I guess careful what you're asking for but but if we're having real talk we could have real talk with a guy like Alex Jones and the point is you know like Brenda and James and Chris and Riley and 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 um, I want to make sure I get the pronunciation correct the chem and the pizzeria. And, and like Chad and Tracy and Ryan Parker and Mark B. Mark watching in from Utah and, and Leah and Mackenzie and Crazy Fast Eddie. And uh, I mean, geez, is, is, is Leth View? Is that Lethbridge View, I wonder? Shout out to Lethbridge this morning. We're going to be paying a lot of attention to Lethbridge in the next few days. Sandra and Terry and Scott and Chris and Tyler. I just want to make sure that you all know how, how, how valued you are. Marilyn and Patrick and Lauren. I mean, I guess I could just keep reading names all day. The, the, the greetings, the morning greetings are are rolling in. You, you know, in the spirit of the, the morning good times, can I actually circle back to the music for a moment? Yeah, sure. I had a, I had a brief chat yesterday with uh, Chris Sterwald from, uh, from the drummer, Ayla Brooke, the drummer, the drummer from Ayla yeah. Brooke, and yeah. he just he wanted to just express his uh, his supreme gratitude for how much exposure they're getting and how much people are just latching well, on to their, to their album because we've been playing it every morning, and we love playing it every morning. Yeah. It is a killer record, dude. Yeah, we do. So Although I will say, with Chris yesterday. you know what, Chris is probably, and I know Chris, so I can say this. Like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little cheeky here, but not totally. Is that Chris probably his spidey senses are tingling, and he probably knows that there are other amazing bands reaching out to us, being like, "Hey guys, you know, they're like with due respect to Ayla Brooke, what's the deal with regards to your future plan?" And give this a listen, and it's it's allowing us to feel like like uh, you know radio station managers in the 1950s when somebody would have come by. You know, their comb in their back pocket, their brill cream, night, you know, perfectly applied with, with hot wax just pressed saying, hey, guys, would you give this a listen and consider giving it a spin? Yep. So we'll see. You know, we'll see how long Ayla, this is how we play. Because what we want to do is we want to renegotiate our contract with Ayla. Brooke, <laughs> is what the, quite frankly... The terms are too our, friendly. Our unwritten contract with Ayla Brooke. The, the, the terms we actually do have written contracts. Oh, we do. Yeah, th- oh. these are just these are the things you don't have to worry about, Sam. We've got contracts with you know. I like not having to worry about these. things. You don't have this to worry great. about it. Yeah. And and uh, here, what is it? Some some random guy. Uh, that's actually the handle. That's not just me dismissing this person. Some random <laughs> guy says, "Don't jinx it. Don't jinx it, Jespo." I think that's in relation to me saying, you know, there are no. Uh, there are no early shenanigans on the on the live thread here on YouTube. Uh, there, there's a lot of comments. Let me just say, so real talk, real talk right now. A lot of you are talking about Danielle Smith, my former colleague on course. We know that there are going to be people tuning in. I talked to a guy yesterday that watches us every single day from London, England. How fantastic is that? People watching us stateside. We can see where people are accessing the website. We know that some of you are tuning in. 
um, for different reasons. Different things are drawing you to this live daily show. And we welcome you here and thank you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to our podcast. Tell everybody you know about it if you think they'd enjoy it. Uh, uh, Danielle Smith, a former colleague of mine uh, at a former billion-dollar Canadian media conglomerate, uh, an AM talk host announcing yesterday that as of February 19th, she's done. She's out of there. She says she's leaving Chorus Radio. She says she's leaving Twitter as well. And she's going to uh, an online destination, a platform called Locals. It's Locals.com. I don't know a ton about it. I did a little bit of digging yesterday to try to better understand it. And uh, that's why we're bringing Idris Fashion on the show coming up in just a second. Idris is going to bring us up to speed on all of this. We're going to talk about the ethics of banning, you know, uh, bad actors like Donald Trump from social media platforms. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, web resources, communities like QAnon and others that I mean, everybody, we need more of this on our radar. And actually, as a matter of fact, over the next number of shows, we're going to be talking to a number of experts about this. Uh, I have been in, in touch with Danielle. Danielle and I have worked together for many years, have, have kind of an interesting relationship, as a matter of fact. Uh, you know, the, the, the 2012 Alberta provincial election that saw the Wild Rose blow a lead, uh, the infamous Lake of Fire election, it was an interview between Danielle and myself. I was hosting a, a television show called Breakfast Television. She was leader of the Wild Rose Party, the official opposition, and, and the Alan Huntsberger thing came up. It was interesting to hear Danielle reference Alan Huntsberger yesterday, saying people wanted me to throw him under the bus, but, but there were other factors at play. You may remember him. He was a South Edmonton pastor whose, whose blog post surfaced about gays burning in a lake of fire, and it happened about a week before the election. did not uh, work out well for the Wild Rose Party. And then Danielle and I, you know, after you know many years of interacting as 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 myself, a program host, a talk show host, uh, and herself, a politician, of course, she came over. You, you remember what happened to the floor crossing? If you're from Alberta, I don't need to explain that to you. But you remember December 2014, mass exodus, official opposition joins the governing progressive conservatives. Uh, one of, in my mind, the most significant stories politically in Alberta's history. Uh, I think it's in the top ten. Um, it might be in the top five, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and then, you know, Danielle's political career, at least at that point, saw an end and she came into broadcasting for the same company I was at. We simulcasted our shows many times. We hit the road together many times, uh, uh, had many assignments together, typically covering elections. Uh, we're pretty familiar with one another. We don't see eye to eye on, on, on a lot of things. Uh, we see eye to eye on, on some things that might surprise you. And we've always had an amicable relationship. I know she's not everybody's cup of tea. Some of you uh, you know, we're upset when she welcomed Kaylin Ford, former political candidate, to, to her show. Uh, you know, Kaylin being accused by some people as being a white supremacist. She's suing all of them now uh, over that. Uh, people were upset that Danielle gave her a platform, that Danielle talked to her. Uh, you know, Danielle had, had explored the idea of hydroxychloroquine as a, you know, an option in treating COVID-19 or combating COVID-19. And, and, and she was certainly uh, taken a task by members of the public for that. And, and, and I can tell you now that both... Well, she's not gone yet, but but I'm gone. I can tell you that that made waves within the company as well. And and uh, I'm sure that Danielle and I will speak about that in future, if you know what I mean, uh, in front of you, this captive audience. So I don't have a comment on on why she's leaving. Uh, many people are speculating that she may uh, be interested in that mayor's office down in Calgary. She's she's she has a, a following, a strong following. That's undeniable. Whether that following is is as strong as she would need it to be within Calgary city limits. I don't know. Uh, she's certainly got a strong rural base. And then there are, and then you take a look though, at the, the so-called right wing conservatives um, and the, and, and the, the, you know, the more sort of social conservatives, that base, that wild rose kind of grassroots, independent thinking, free thinking, libertarian esque. you know, that the community I'm talking about, the greater community in Alberta uh, from which she has drawn a lot of support in past Um you know, how many of those folks are ready to to forgive and forget? I mean, there's still anger. Uh, you know, I, I remember I can tell you I've seen it with my own eyes. Danielle and I would host a show together and this text line in front of us. As soon as she would start talking, people, would, why don't you cross the floor? You, you know, you Judas, you turncoat. I'm going, geez, like that was that was like two Olympics ago, man. That was that was a long time ago. Like, the, you know, but. People have short memories on th some things when it comes to politics. People have really long memories when it comes to other things. And oftentimes the longer memories are the things that hit people personally, right? I mean, you use you, you utilize the name or you employ or invoke the name Trudeau in Alberta. And a lot of times uh, people are upset at the name, not because of Justin, but because of Pierre Elliott, right? Because of, of something 40, 45, 50 years ago. You may say, I don't care if it was 40 years ago, you know. 
at a time when Alberta's economy was in the tank, they, you know, he put his, you know, heel on the throat of the province with the national energy program, and, and that resentment remains. In the meantime, you talk about other political scandals with, with politicians that are maybe a little more palatable to some of these people, and their memories are a little shorter. So I'll be curious to see what Danielle does. She is doing a pay-for-play setup. In other words, she'll be hosting a show. She says she's basically, well, she doesn't want to be canceled. And, and you know, I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Danielle. My understanding is that she's, quite frankly, kind of had enough. She's kind of had enough of uh, being in the line of fire. Uh, in, 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 to paraphrase her message yesterday, afraid of, walk, uh, not afraid, tired of, of walking on eggshells. Not up for it anymore. I've seen some of you candidly say, you know, what exactly was Danielle Smith not allowed to say on Chorus Radio that she needs to be able to put out there because she had a pretty long leash? Uh, she did, but I can tell you as well uh, a, a view from the inside that the leash was getting shorter and shorter. Um, you know, so we're going to talk to her about this. I, I can I can tell you that, and you'll hear an interview. Uh, with her on this show before you'll hear it anywhere else so that's coming up it's not coming up soon but i'll let you know when it's coming up uh that with danielle smith all right let's get the show rolling bitcoin well is the title and presenting sponsor of the show i think this is the latest we've ever rolled in 12 minutes in we're rolling into our opener uh, here our cold opens vary and is I- idris is like patiently waiting yep. just sitting yep. there going he's, like anytime just hanging out he's anytime got, he's got a big smile he's having a good going, time going any t- if you ever if yeah. you ever if you ever get tired of the sound of your own voice feel free to Bring me into the conversation, considering I woke up early for you. Probably brewed a coffee. I don't know if Idris is into latte. I don't know what's going on. Bitcoin is all over the map right now. And uh, a huge surge, you know, as, as one of my buddies said, you know, as the capital falls, Bitcoin rises. I'm going, wow, that seems a little dramatic. You know, it's like the movie guy, right? In a time, one man wanted to create wealth. Should I do all the spots like this today? So we're trying to make sense of it. And then a big drop yesterday and and people that have questions about Bitcoin are going, whoa, and people that are big and bullish on it are going, hey, it dropped big time. Great time to buy. If you have questions about it, do what I did literally yesterday on my personal time. Literally yesterday, I was dealing with Bitcoin well because I'm getting into Bitcoin myself. Now, don't sell your house or take my advice financially. Disclaimers everywhere. But if this is something you want to get into, you can check out Bitcoin well under the sponsors page at ryanjesperson.com. Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. All right, on the live uh, YouTube comments, Zigzag Wanderer. That's a great name. Zigzag Wanderer says, Why take the abuse? You know, talking about Danielle Smith, her departure from a talk radio, a prominent Canadian talk radio host, a conservative host, says, Why, yeah, why would you take the abuse? I can't blame her. You know, a lot of threats on the text line. Apparently, when Ryan said it was toxic, everybody was was, you know, uh, on his side. Where's the equality that from Ziggs? Where's the lack of equality? What do you mean? Uh, so, yeah, some people, I've seen some people. People are being tough on Danielle online. People are always tough on Danielle online in so many ways. Is she and I face fire from different uh, from different communities, I guess you might say. Right. Typically. I get hammered on by the far right that, that doesn't think I'm conservative enough for their liking. And, and typically she'll take shots. I want to say the far left, but, she'll, you know, it's different places on the spectrum. Now, I still take my shots from the left. And, and she, as mentioned, still takes her shots from the right. So people are equal opportunity zigzag wanderer. Uh, only Danielle knows the real reasons for her departure. But we do know where she's going. And that's where Idris Fashion comes into the mix. Uh, looking forward to this. A 20 year a content marketing and sales manager who's called Alberta home for just as long. You'll find Idris at the Well Creative Consultants, where he matches up marketing and technical specialists with the companies that need them, making his Real Talk debut this morning. Idris, welcome, and thanks for making time for us today. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Do we do we have his uh, video, Sam? We ready to rock and roll? It looks like there's maybe some troubleshooting. There we no, go. Wait, I had the wrong split screen loaded. Okay. Three way split. Well, it's you were just so enthralled by the opener that you were you were a little you were a little taken aback. It's good to see you. It feels like it's been I don't know. It feels like it's been a few years since our paths have crossed in person. Happy New Year to you and welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And uh, it has been. I think it's been probably two years. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, we're, we're grateful to have you here and, and your perspective. I want to I want to kind of my plan today with this interview, knowing your area of expertise and your perspectives is to take a question, throw it your way and then just get out of the way. So why don't we start with what we're talking about locally here? Um, because it's it's obviously not just a local story, a, a terrestrial radio host, a mainstream media host, so to speak. Uh, Danielle Smith leaves what I can tell you is a pretty plum gig. Um, I mean, especially let me just say, and I'm, this is the last time I'm going to make this about me because it's not about me, but just to say, uh, since I was canned back in September, uh, they just, I don't know what their plan was, but they just gave Danielle the province. So she had doubled her reach. She had doubled her broadcast radius. Uh, she had the ears of the province on, on a relatively well-listened radio station. The rumor is the, the ratings have been plummeting since September. Uh, but, but Idris, um, she decides to go to a place called locals.com. What are we dealing with here? What is this all about for people that are unfamiliar? Well, Locals.com, now don't be fooled by the name. The name almost suggests it's a singles place. It's not a singles place at all. It's, <laughs> it's in fact, uh, um, like a, a, a microblogging social network, um, and it's on a different model. It's something that is focused on crowdfunding and subscription. So unlike, say, you know, like a paid media service where you would, in fact, have subscriptions, but you might also have uh, ad revenue, um, Locals.com is in, in fact a little bit different. So you can go there, you can have your own content and you can post your content there. You can, you know, connect with people, build your network, and you can also set up a uh, paid thing, sort of like Patreon or some of the other sort of subscription models out there. But how it's marketed is that they promise no deplatforming. So they promise that. Um, if you are someone who's a little bit on the fringe, if you have content that might not appeal to, a, you know, a wider base or might be a little bit more on the spectrum of one end or the other, uh, politically speaking, that you don't have to suffer the risk. You will not have uh, a deep platforming uh, entity like Twitter, say, or something like that. So, Idris, this is this is they're they're like regardless. I mean, if 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 I go on there. Uh, and, and I mean, if I go in there as a full blown Nazi and, and start, I mean, raising some, you know, organizing some sort of uprising against, you know, ethnic minority groups or really, I mean, like how, I mean, how, to what extent do they say you won't be deep plot? It's a complete free for all. Well, let me give you a little background on it too, because it was started by a chap by the name of Dave Rubin and Dave Rubin used to have uh, what was called the Rubin Report yeah. back uh, probably about four years ago. It was really kind of popular, uh, and it was a libertarian uh, YouTube channel. Uh, he had a whole bunch of stuff on Patreon, and he came under fire a while back and uh, basically was uh, throttled down by YouTube and uh, deplatformed essentially by Patreon. So a lot of his colleagues, Jordan Peterson, members of UKIP, uh, some other players in the right wing, all kind of came back and said, you know, we need something else. And so what Ruben kind of started in 2019 was this offer. Um, it was a different name and then they changed it to locals.com. But the idea was, pardon me, the idea was that you wouldn't have to worry about being on the fringe and having your platform removed from you uh, and losing your uh, audience or your income. So, so this is typically uh, more, I mean, is this, it's in its infancy, relatively speaking, right? It just, I mean, how much do we know about uh, sort of who gathers? So you take a look at, at parlor, for example, and, and, May I ask you a favor that, as I know you will, for the next 11 minutes or so that we chat, pl please assume that that many of us don't have a deep knowledge of some of these platforms. So I think a lot of people have a lot of questions, for example, about Parler. Uh, you know, it's been in the news because there are there are prominent sort of you know right wing conservatives there. That's where they're gathering, including Alberta conservatives that are now advertising, you know, as Parler's being deep temporarily, let's say, deplatformed by Amazon some Alberta conservatives are saying, hey, join me there. That's where you'll find me. Um, is locals or locals.com, is that is this, is this similar? Is it typically drawing uh, conservative voices or, or, or more uh, socially conservative voices? What do we know about the community? Yeah, it is. Uh, and what we're seeing right now is a really interesting clustering. Uh, a lot of different platforms are marketing themselves to 
conservative mindsets, mm-hmm. conservative influencers, and conservative media hopefuls. So because they have captive audiences and because they are proving to be uh, strong audiences to market to. So looking outside of the perspective of who they are and what they say, um, they cluster really well. They're easily easy to market to. And um, you can, when you have platforms that answer or that market themselves to audiences like that, say like Parler or Locals, you end up with a lot of crossover. Um, and that's something that, you know, the larger big tech firms could have, but they, they don't necessarily. You don't see the same kind of um, influencers getting together uh, on the same level that you do with, uh, say, Parler or Locals, where there is just a different energy. There's a, a, a really strong, um, energized uh, desire to work together. And I think part of that is the political, you know, spectrum and the likability of people who are similar to you, politically speaking. But I think the, the platforms themselves are going small. The idea is that, you know, there's more that we can do with not trying to take over the whole universe like a YouTube, but instead answering and, and, and supporting things that sit outside of what they consider norm. Which is a, a really smart business model, right? I mean, 30 years ago, Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch did it in, in creating Fox. They didn't, they didn't try to steal everybody from NBC and CBS and ABC. Uh, what they did was try to provide a home uh, or try to create, and successfully they did, create the perception of a home for people ideologically and otherwise, right? And they've built a cult following. And, I mean, one of the things is, and, you know, I've talked about this in other conversations too, which is, you know, the demographic heft, you know, the, the fact that you can, on digital, get so precise with how you advertise to people. Yeah. There is a real benefit to blocking people out into different subsections and marketing to that channel specifically, that idea, that mindset, that particular, you know, uh, philosophy. If you were able to to noodle down in that and, and, and gather those people into one place, it gets a lot easier to market to them. Jar so is right. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Jar was is watching in right now. Says anybody wondering what Parlor contains or what it allows? You can go ahead on Reddit and just check out uh, Parlor Watch. Uh, what is what does the future of Parlor look like, Idris? I mean, what 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 what's the future for this platform? What's the deal? Take us inside. Well, okay, so I, I've, I've noodled around with parlor here and there uh it's a micro blogging social network you know not unlike you know twitter or uh the other sort of platforms that are out there but it it really does try to market itself to very far right-leaning uh perspectives and audiences uh and uh and and mindsets so if you are yourself a fringe thinker that might not necessarily be on the right um suddenly it becomes a little bit different of a place in terms of policing. So some of the people that I've seen and watched have been, you know, throttled themselves who have been more of the alt left than the alt right. Um, so it's, it's not uh, with a, any sort of, you know, journalistic balance or any kind of uh, philosophical balance that these guys are exercising. Um, it's really just kind of being policed uh, for the right and, and catered to the right. Um, and specifically the far, far leaning folk. So it, 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 it doesn't police. I mean, this is why it's come under fire, uh, because it doesn't police content that, in fact, uh, you know, goes against their own content rules, which is, you know, spreading violence or promoting violence. Um, and that came back to haunt them. Uh, which instead, which seems to me interesting. Down. that that's yeah. just more of a disclaimer to keep them out of trouble. I don't know that I don't know that's actually a rule or 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 a real commitment on their part to ensure that there's no incitement on the platform. I see plenty of evidence that there is. Yeah, and it, it's a problem because you know that that stems out of the you know kind of content argument and philosophical or the spirit of you know what we're doing and into the law. You know now you're you're vulnerable. As a, as a corporation. So, you know, and th- th- strangely enough, this is one of the things that Trump was really good at. Trump was great at just going up to the line and not crossing the line. Yeah. 
The question, the question is, has he, has he, has he, has he briefly, uh, but significantly crossed the line with, with tiny little things? I mean, the, the, uh, what, what was the one that I saw reported by MSNBC the other day? It was, it was his tweet that said something like, you know, rally in DC on the sixth, you know, be here, going to be wild or something. And legal experts are wondering if these tiny little things would count as the seeds of insurrection, which I think probably could be argued. And we'll see what happens with these impeachment hearings. Uh, probably could be argued successfully. Yeah, but I mean, further to that, there are people that are not that clever who are on Parler who are saying some pretty nasty stuff and are promoting, uh, you know, acts of violence, are promoting the, uh, you know, com- commitments against other people, you know, things like doing things against other people. And I mean, it's it's remarkable to, to, to be able to see that um, in an open forum and in, you know, in a place where, they're inviting the public to participate. So, you know, it's a strange world we're in right now because, you know, the, the, the content uh, policing uh, on the one hand with the major big tech is becoming stronger and, and, and more mighty. And at the same time, we've got these fringe places and small, like, you know, locals and parlor where they're trying to pull back and, and, and not police it at all. And so you, you've got this real tension between, you know, how these things are, are being really done. Idris, uh, you got an interest. I mean, tons of interesting uh, discussion underway on our live YouTube thread. Real talkers are at it this morning and Sonny uh, tuned in, says, OK, so these far right social media platforms are places for fascists to meet and share ideas. Wonderful. Uh, you know, you, you take a look, Sam, can we call up? This was just a graphic and this may this may be out of date by now. I mean, this was actually over the weekend, but the, the president banned from uh, I mean, you take a look at the social platforms. That's base. I mean, that's pretty much ticking off almost all of them. Uh, I mean, he's banned from Shopify, for Pete's sake. So you're going to have to wait to get your Trump stakes, everybody. But uh, Facebook, Twitter, I mean, you can see there's Spotify, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, Pinterest, TikTok. I mean, the the list, YouTube, it's huge. Now, Idris, of course, people may snicker. And, uh, you know, me in a moment of of simply being snide tweeted in response. Yeah, beat it. Uh, You know, I think we've seen enough. But what really happens, Donald Trump doesn't lose his perspective. He doesn't lose his uh, his his commitment here. I mean, I think we've seen him from banging on podium saying we will never surrender. Uh, 70 million plus people voted for him uh, just a couple of months ago. Let's not forget. And we saw evidence on January 6th that he's got an army of people that will do anything he says and we'll go find him wherever he is. So so along the lines of what Sonny's talking about here with these platforms where, where people are going to gather is is it potentially detrimental uh, to the health and the and the good of greater society to be forcing a lot of these ideas underground behind paywalls out of the sunlight you know I have to I have to take a step back here and 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 and, and really reflect on that myself I, I was doing this last night and thinking about you know what people have been calling the internet death penalty which is what Trump has been experiencing now with all of these platforms cutting him off, cutting the head of the president off. So digitally, he's dead. But physically, his message has a place. In an audience perspective, 70 million people still believe him. So he still has a place. So what happens? What happens is exactly what you fear, which is these things go back underground. They end up in fringe places. And those conversations never get the light of day. And there's a, there's a real threat to leaving those things in dark places and unmonitored, unmanaged, and without any contact to uh, other people and other perspectives on the other side of the, of the coin. Um, we know, I mean, I, I identify as a black man and I've been black for about 46 years. So I know that, you know, you need to have contact with people who, uh, oppose you in order to help them through their own thinking and getting to the point where they see error in the way of being, you know, racist. And if I can't do that, if I can't connect with those people face to face, if those people are allowed to just congregate and feed each other, it becomes a much dangerous, more dangerous place because they feel like they don't need me anymore. We don't have to work together on solutions to help society. We don't have to have conversations that are tough for either of us. 
it's a very dangerous situation that we're setting up here. And we've given a lot of authority to very large big tech companies to make that decision for us. And I'm concerned about that as a citizen. We've got, I mean, we've got some great uh, conversation and debate underway online. People saying, <laughs> Caleb, uh, watching us out of Vancouver, says, I-, I wonder what Donald Trump's Pinterest boards look like. It's it's kind of funny. I mean, I think so. I think some of these platforms, I think, some, but, you know, somebody said somebody else said here, where is the where's the comment about Etsy or something? Somebody said something like if, if Donald Trump's allowed on Etsy, he'll be selling tea cozies and hate. Um, so cheeky. <laughs> cheeky uh but 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 in all seriousness i think a lot of these platforms probably had to get ahead of the story or at least wanted to maybe let me say more accurately participate in the story uh to send a message that regardless of whether or not it would be a good fit i mean we haven't heard from only fans yet uh the, you know the pay for porn site uh maybe trump could wind up there careful what you ask for but but i think for the most part these platforms wanted to say we're joining the consortium to send a message that this is not okay. Because let's be clear, Donald Trump may go away. We had a really fascinating conversation with Ian Bremmer about this last week, uh, who said Donald Trump will go away, in a way, uh, but Trumpism will not. And there will be another, and potentially a younger and more marketable and more compelling person that will step forward and seize uh, the attention and the loyalty of this community. So, you know, you have to think that these, these platforms and probably society as a whole including our viewing audience today, got a real wake-up call last Wednesday when we saw what happened on D.C., when online conversation, when online rallying uh, and and, and the gathering and the fanning the flames of ideology becomes very real. And all of a sudden, you've got cops being beaten with flagpoles with the American flag. I mean, what what an iconic image for all the wrong reasons. Uh, Idris, it's a real pleasure to have you here on the show. I'm looking forward to bringing you back on a panel, and thanks for making time for us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I love that guy. You can follow Idris on Twitter at the Content Kid. Um, uh, as you can tell, knows who he's talking about, uh, and uh, an advisor when it comes to, to marketing, communications, and and sales as well. Uh, Jason Leader coming up in just a moment. Conservative strategist. We're going to talk about the cabinet shuffle we saw in Ottawa today. A few. Uh, players uh, changing benches, if you will, after Navdi Baines announcing that he will not seek re-election. want to remind you how proud we are to partner with the team at Friesen Brothers. Friesen Brothers has been in the grocery game in the province of Alberta for more than 60 years, the entire time family owned. And right now we want to remind you that one of the things that sets them apart as they attempt to pique your interest around this Alberta store, their 15th, opening up in Edmonton in just a couple of months. You know, they've got the Red Seal chefs. They've got master butchers. Their bakers are the best in the business, and they're all using Alberta products. That's why they only carry Alberta beef, Alberta turkey, Alberta pork. I mean, Alberta flour in their sourdough. That's how serious they are about this. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown, Alberta owned. Same deal with St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Local ownership at Alberta's best Jeep dealerships. 2021 is going to be a huge year for the Jeep lineup. If you're into Jeeps, you probably already know this. You've probably been like me online, like refreshing your browser every week to see what new pictures are leaking of that 2021 Grand Wagoneer. Woo! This is the one that's going to go toe-to-toe with Navigator and Escalade and and, and the the X5 from Beamer and the Benz. This is going to be a beautiful SUV. Uh, Scott and his team at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge are the go-to for that. All right, let's take a look at the headlines. As mentioned, uh, political strategist Jason Leader joining us in just a moment, uh, chiming in from Ontario on this federal cabinet shuffle we've just seen this morning after uh, Navdeep Baines announced that he'll be leaving his post as Canada's Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry because he will not be running in the next election. There's an election coming, everybody. We'll find out what Jason thinks about that. That means that uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, previously Foreign Affairs Minister, Francois-Philippe Champagne, moves into the uh, role formerly held by Navdeep Baines. It means that Mark Garneau, former Canadian astronaut, obviously leaves the transportation post hey, Jason, to replace... Uh, can I just hear your mic quickly? You're live, buddy. 
to all of us. These are the these are the behind the scenes things that are happening with Sam Brooks. He's making sure our next interview is ready to go. So Mark Garno into foreign affairs, and then that means Omar Al Gabra moves into cabinet to take over transportation. Jim Carr back with uh, it sounds like a clean bill of health, which is great. Moves back into cabinet as a special representative to the prairies. When it comes to vaccines, Alberta's premier is among those provincial leaders in the province that are saying, hey, listen, we're running shy of vaccine supply capabilities there. The frontline workers have been doing an amazing job. You heard yesterday from Ryan Imgrund on the show that Alberta is actually leading the nation in inoculations. Premier Jason Kenney saying Alberta needs to expand its vaccination program to include emergency medical responders, paramedics. By the way, we have more emails from paramedics and and family members of paramedics than I've seen on a single subject in a long time. And that's saying something. This is all over our radar, this story. Uh, Premier knows it because he was talking about it yesterday. He says, but listen, our supplies are precarious. Uh, He says Alberta basically needs a huge surprise shipment. By next week, Alberta projecting to be short at least 20,000 doses. But he says that number could be even higher. Some rumblings about Alberta looking to procure its own vaccine supply. Uh, Jason Leader on that in just a moment. And how about this? Uh, Out of the hockey world, uh, as the National Hockey League prepares to drop the puck on another shortened season, that's going to be tomorrow. Interesting news out of the San Jose Sharks organization. Uh, Did you see this? Evander Kane, uh, San Jose Hockey Now reporting that Kane and the San Jose Sharks are being sued for more than $8 million by Centennial Bank. It gets worse, though. Daniel Kaplan reporting for The Athletic reporting yesterday the hockey star filing for chapter 7 bankruptcy with 26.8 million dollars worth of debt which includes that centennial bank amount and the petition the bankruptcy petition states that Kane I threw in a few of his Instagram photos to give you a sense he may opt out of the upcoming NHL season 47 creditors named in the complaint that also includes the fact that Patrick Kane uh, or rather pardon me Evander Kane allegedly lost a million and a half dollars in gambling in the last year alone. Interesting story out of the hockey world. All right, let's get uh, to this. I'm, I'm looking forward to this because Jason Leader's got a unique perspective. You know, we'll bring in political pundits that, well, you know, they're a political scientist from here, or this is somebody that, you know, keeps an eye on things as a journalist or a newspaper columnist. Uh, this dude's been on the inside, uh, former advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and several conservative premiers, also the president of Enterprise Canada. Welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for making time for us, Jason. Hey, thanks for having me, Ryan. Appreciate it. Yeah, you, you know, you talk about this cabinet shuffle this morning, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to your takes on some of the shuffles and who's moving into what roles, but it, all it seems kicked off by Navdeep Bain's announcement he wouldn't seek re-election. <laughs> I saw something interesting yesterday in all my group chats and text conversations and private messages with friends, my liberal friends, my conservative friends, there weren't a lot of kind words for how Nav D. Baines has performed. Well, why do you think that is? What's your take on this guy? I think the best you can say about Nav D. Baines is, is he had potential that was unrealized, you know, it was like, Oh, I wish he would have done more. Like even the, even his best friends. And by the way, he and the prime minister used to be very close friends. I, I assume they're still friends, but he was really pissed off when he didn't get the, the, the finance job the first time. Mm. And then when he didn't get it the second time and then the third time, you know, when Bill was reappointed and then was Bill fired and Christian Freeland, he was pretty mad. So I get the sense he probably, you know, thought I'm going to, take a look at, you know, stay home with the kids, maybe find a job. So everyone's wondering what, what his next job is going to be as well. And, and how that could, that's going to go. But I got to tell you, this guy, tons of potential, really nice guy. And, and like, you know, find something that the industry minister did over the last five years. I mean, super clusters, I mean, come on, right. I mean, this is a joke. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a joke for government policy run amok and, and wasted money. So, um, you know, it's too bad for fans of his, but I got to tell you, it's uh, Canadians aren't going to notice much of a difference. That's for sure. Well, and I think that that's probably, I mean, when, when you take on a certain portfolio and people have high expectations and maybe if you don't deliver or to be fair, because Jason, I'm sure you've seen this as well from cabinet ministers that there's probably a lot going on behind the scenes. It's not that they're lazy or incompetent, but maybe it's not high profile headline grabbing stuff. But if you're the minister of innovation, science and industry, you'd think that that would be something that you could communicate progress on and vision. What would an effective minister in this portfolio look like to you? What sort of things would you say they should be focusing on? 
Yeah, that's a great, you actually got to be a good manager. I know that sounds really boring, Ryan, but this, this department is, is brutal. It's, it's like telecom. It's this weird mix of, you know, telecom and industry policy and science and like research, none of it really sort of hangs together. And, and somebody has to go in there, sort of blow it up and then put it back together. Like every once in a while they get, they get focused on the auto bailout in 2008. Then they're focused on sales phone rates the next year. Then they're, and none of it ever really is, is, is good news or, and the truth is too, um, the person who's in charge of this, I mean, government can't solve these problems. Government doesn't do a lot of these things well that we're talking about. So they have to actually, um, you know, sort of pull government out of what they need to be, not, don't need to be in and work on the commercializing some of that research that's out there. Nobody's been able to get a handle on this. I will say, you know, it's not just Mr. Baines that hasn't really done a a bang up job there. It's been a really tough department to get going, but this is one of those ones where the federal government has a lot of people working in Ottawa that don't really do much on the economic side. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, most Canadians wouldn't miss the industry department if it was, if it was gone other than sort of cell phone regulation. Frankly. Okay. So if you were still advising the PMO uh, under a different prime minister, what would be the word to these senior cabinet ministers with regards to when we're going to need to know whether or not you're seeking re-election. I mean, the, the assumption here, yeah. the implication is that there's an election coming at some point, right? Yeah, bang on. So like, I saw I saw the cabinet shuffle, which, by the way, was a little bit of a surprise. And uh, last night, I, I, I immediately sort of tweeted, like, election coming, spring yeah. election. Now, Mr. Trudeau has been working on this for a little while. He's mad that he didn't sort of have the stones to call one in the fall and or, you know, engineer one that probably could have happened. Uh, he's determined to have one in the spring. And, and the reason for that is pretty simple. It's wartime out there, right? Like, it's, you know, we're fighting a different war. We're not fighting an enemy other, you know, like traditional enemy. We're fighting this virus. And, and he's, you know, war in wartime, you know, uh, governments are generally reelected. Look across, you know, just in BC, you know, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan. Um, that's just the way it goes. So he told all of his people, you got to let me know by the end of the calendar year. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of them said, probably not offering up. And, uh, and Mr. Baines, you know, he's a big domino to fall, regardless of what I said about the department before. Uh, the truth is he's a big advisor to Mr. Trudeau and, a, and one of his key team members in a key riding as well, Ryan. I mean, Northwest Toronto suburbs, liberals own that territory federally. Doug Ford owns it provincially. It's a, it's a swing riding. So they got to get somebody in these, in these areas that, uh, that can run in this election. So not a surprise, but, Trudeau would have said and did say to them, I got to know by the end of the year. And 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 he got, a, I think, a bit of a surprise from Mr. Bain. <laughs> the longer that you and I talk, the longer my list of questions gets, because I just want to dig into everything you're saying. But you, <laughs> you talk about regret that you think that the prime minister may have for not calling an election back in the fall. We saw the, some of the politicians. Yeah. I mean, it worked out well for some. I think of John Horgan off the top of my head, and there are others for sure. Why do you think the prime Scott minister... Paul. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, obviously, right? And it and, and worked out all right. And well, I, maybe some of the concern was, was being gun shy about sending people to the polls during a pandemic. I don't know, maybe the optics of it. Why do you think the prime minister didn't? And what do you think has changed now? They obviously believe that the conservatives are, are a little more precarious than they were under Andrew Scheer, right? I mean, isn't that the point? They want to move from minority back to majority? Yeah, think about think about how the media covers uh, these right now, Ryan. And, and so, first of all, there's no time for the opposition. Now, Alberta, there's a little more time right now. Mr. Kenny's had, a, you know, a, a tough month and we were hearing a little bit more from the NDP. But most places in in Canada, you're not hearing it from the opposition. Like Aaron O'Toole is not getting, you know, sort of equal time to Mr. Mr. Trudeau. Mr. Trudeau is out in front of his cottage. His government ministers are out. They're making announcements. They're spending money. And most Canadians, regardless of how, you know, I'm, I'm no fan of Mr. Trudeau, but most Canadians think, man, I'm so glad we're not in the U.S. or man, I'm so glad we're not in, you know, we're handling it a little bit better than other places. And so, you know, that mix of government getting all the airtime and share a voice and 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 uh, fighting a war, it's hard to make changes in a war. You know, it's hard to sort of say, OK, we're going to change generals. We're going to go from that guy to that guy or that guy to that woman. It's very difficult to change to change gears like that. So Canadians, I think Trudeau has no he probably missed his opportunity. He was trying to get too cute in the fall, right? He was trying to get the opposition to defeat him uh, so he wasn't claimed for the election. And I think his advisors have come to the conclusion that it's probably best to just go visit the governor general, ask for a mandate after the after vaccines get rolling and say, I'm best to lead us into the recovery. I'm not saying that he is. I'm just saying that's probably what his that's what his advisors I know have uh, have come to the conclusion on. Let me let me ask you, you, you touched on opposition voices and coverage and, you know, obviously politicians making hay, especially in opposition when a government faces scandal or pushback 
I'm actually I'm curious to know what you make of what's going on in Alberta right now, because because I would say uh, and we took a look. Do you hey Sam, are you able to pull up on short notice that that uh, is it Main Street polling? I think it was that showed uh, I, I some, saw the I saw the poll. You know what I'm talking about. Sam will put it up. I know he'll get it on short notice. But but two of the things I want to point out, not the fact that the conservatives are struggling right now. That's fine. And that's fair. And I, quite frankly, I think some of their numbers will b- bounce back. People have short memories. Yeah. Um, I, I was especially intrigued by the fact that uh, the the Wilders in Independence Party saw a bit of a, a rise, a bit of a bump up in support. The Alberta Party actually saw a drop in the midst of challenge faced by the government, which has to be a real punch in the gut to people that are cheering for the Alberta party. But really, Jason, we haven't heard. I mean, there's there's been the odd tweet from former Premier Notley or former Deputy Premier Hoffman. But but really, I mean, we've heard, we had forty three hundred plus respondents to our survey to our question about this last week. But there it is. Thanks, Sam. So you, so you see there, I mean, the Wild Rose Party is up. The, the Alberta party looks like I provided one. That's my fault that cut off the Alberta party. But it's bad news. They're at like three um, percent. Jason, if you're, we, if you're below that cutoff point, you're if, in bad news. Yeah, anyway. if you're below the show this thread <laughs> Link, that says a lot, yeah. doesn't it? But my yeah. point is we haven't actually heard a lot from the NDP, the official opposition in Alberta. We're hearing mostly we're hearing mostly from the people, from the public. Yeah, well, here's the thing, right? And and this is uh, the NDP makes a lot of mistakes. I think, I, you know, in their first term, uh, Ms. Notley grew into the job for sure. And I think at the end of it, most Albertans, the, at least the focus groups I saw, the data that I saw, the people that I talked to said, uh, you know, didn't really love the NDP. She was OK. Some people were really mad at her, uh, but it's time to get back to sort of conservative principles. And so now uh, the, the, they've smartened up a little bit, right? They've been around. They've been around power for four to five years. If your opponent's having a tough time, the best thing you can do is generally get out of the way. Yeah. So, um, you know, for, for, for them, uh, you know, sort of wading into this and then all the questions about, well, where were your people? Did any of your people leave? Like all that kind of stuff, it gets more difficult. So when your opponent's sort of hanging himself, that's the old adage in politics, you know, you don't, you don't sort of snip the noose and, and start talking to yourself. You get out of there and, uh, and, and let them sort of uh, make their own mistakes. So I think it's actually smart on the, on the NDP's per, per ha- behalf to actually sort of tamp it down and not go their, their initial, most of their caucus would have been so excited about this, right? So excited to attack. And I think they probably had to, had to tamp some of that down. So I, I honestly, probably a smart move to stay out of the news a little bit, can you, but I will say, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to step on your toes there, Jason. I was wondering, can you think of a time um, I'll ask you to be candid. Can you think of a time in your political career as a senior advisor to a prime minister or to a premier uh, where, where all of a sudden you went, Oh, boy, like it's not one person that that in this case that traveled. There's like there's six or ten that we know about. And I have have nothing to base this on except for my gut instinct. But I suspect there's more. Uh, The the NDP has gone on record and said all 24 MLAs were home. That's fine. I'm sure they have their own issues and problems. But can you think of a time in your political career where you had to get control of something that could have exploded into a wildfire? You know, you know where it usually comes up is is an expense scandal. So um, you'll you'll get one minister's expenses or, you know, the premier or the boss or whoever's expenses. And you'll say, oh, man, that is that's not good. They probably have to go. And then you start asking some questions and you think, oh, oh, this doesn't look, you know, <laughs> this is wider than we, we might have thought. <laughs> um, you know, and this happens to all parties. I'm not just talking about one party or others, but I've seen it a number of times with organizations and or governments that I've advised or worked with where you're like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so has to go. And then you're like, well, wait a second, does so-and-so have to go? Because maybe, you know, like there might be five or six people in that kind of thing. I've seen it most often in, in expense um, sort of things where it's like, you know, we joke about the $16 orange juice or, you know, the David Dingwalls, I'm entitled to my entitlements, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the problem is when you scrape the surface, you usually find that there's a little more than you uh, were hoping to find. I am entitled to my entitlements is the most incredible incredible political quote of all time that's got to be the so best it's, uh, it's it's in the pantheon for but sure can you and, think uh, yeah. yeah can you can you imagine i, I remember you know we'll, we'll go like I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of like really fresh squeezed orange juice i think it's, it goes back to my childhood when my parents yeah. like on sunday morning would at my mom would be like yeah. using legit real oranges and making. i mean i've just always had oh. a thing for it and i get that it's yeah. expensive but that is that is the most significant 16 dollars that's ever been claimed in years removed from that, how do you feel about the scandal around Bev Oda? Like she probably watches headlines today and she's like, what the hell? <laughs> how am I? What are like, they, how you know, am I, mean, I the, the pariah? 
This is this is well, one thing I will say, like, you know, in terms of I, I'm not one of these guys that I, I deal with the media every day, but like in terms of media bias and she got a raw deal. Now, number one, number one, she wasn't a great minister. Number two, that photo of her sort of standing behind the the, the justice building smoking that dart smoking, you know, that went yeah. along with the, the, the photo or the, the, the issue just yeah. sort of she'd had a couple of bad months and then all of a sudden this this blows up. But let's be honest. I mean, like you, you usually it's usually not the thing that lights the match. It's usually, um, you know, uh, usually the pro the boss was looking to for a way to uh, sort of move you out anyway. And, uh, you know, when the, the bosses, the prime ministers, the premiers, the party leaders, they'll stand up for the people who they really need to keep. Um, but the people who have sort of, you know, angered them or frustrated them or caused them some anxiety over the last little bit, you get in any trouble, that's when you're going to uh, uh, go, because they're not going to spend their political capital on you. They're going to spend it on themselves, right? I know you keep an eye on Alberta to a certain extent. Have, have you monitored? Sure. Are you familiar with, with Mayor Nenshi out of Calgary and his chief of staff traveling? Uh, he, he well, I, yeah, I, I did. I did some, I did, I did a show on it last week. I actually, I, you know, the problem is for the conservatives and the, the Nenshi want, I was furious when Nenshi's staff didn't when Nenshi didn't make his staff uh, step down after what he said uh, about you know Miss Minister Allard and Jamie Huckabee's tra based travel in the UCP sort of I think he said something like I wanted to scream at the TV or something like that when he was watching it knowing what he knew which is he had given his own staff uh, the AOK -okay, two staff members to go to, to go to Hawaii I will say it's just Mr. Mayor Nenshi, uh, he's, uh, you know, I just, uh, I don't even know if we can, you know, it's a family show. I won't, I won't swear. It's, there's a lot of BS. Oh, dude, you can guy. say, you can say bullshit. You can say whatever. It's not a family show. That's uh, exactly. the beauty no, of it. But this, this guy is bullshit. And, and, and the problem is, you know, he's exactly that kind of guy. He's on CBC one day saying I wanted to throw my, scream at the TV and throw my remote or whatever. And knowing that he gave his chief of staff, the AOK -okay to go to, to, to Hawaii. It's just like, that is so, that is Nenshi in a, in a, in a box. That is Nenshi in a in a thumbnail sketch right there. And and listen, he's done some good things. I know some people think he's a good mayor, but he's just he's a phony. And uh, you know that was a pretty telling episode. I thought. If you're watching or listening live to Jason Leader right now, president of Enterprise Canada, uh, former advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and several Conservative premiers, and you missed our conversation with Mayor Nenshi on Friday, you can find it, of course, on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe. Uh, to our podcast, and you can also find a, a two-minute clip. I, I showed you where I had a bit of an exchange with him. Uh, that's on my Twitter profile. Back with Jason in just a second. Wanted to remind you that the team of Al at Alta Moving and Storage is ready right now to help you execute your plan, whether it's a New Year's resolution or, 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 or whether you're not calling it that, but it's, it's just a good intention that you have to upsize or downsize to finally make that move, but you want to do it without the stress that comes with it. You know, they say moving is one of the three most stressful things you're doing in your life. Alta Moving and Storage has these pod style containers that customize the scenario for you to make sure you get what you need, including providing movers or not, whatever you want. And then, of course, also long and short term storage solutions. You can find Alta Storage online at altastorage.ca or give them a call, Alta Storage and Moving, 780 993 Alta. We're also very grateful to have Kubi Energy on board. You know, yesterday, the debut, we'll do it every Monday, of positive reflections. We want to see the photos, the stories. We want to hear you talk about or show us what made you smile. Kubi Energy presents positive reflections every Monday. They're locally owned and operated. They're solar system installers, all certified electricians. So they're employing Alberta and BC certified tradespeople. They even apply for the grants on your behalf. You don't have to deal with the city of Edmonton, for example, right now that'll give you four thousand bucks off your residential installed solar system you can check out kubienergy.ca that's k-u-b-y energy.ca jason leader our guest uh conservative strategist and we're talking politics kind of kind of across the country right now if there is an election to be had uh at any time soon we know that canada's conservatives will be looking to to make good on some of the encouraging results from back in october and including beating the liberals on total vote count and obviously sending a pretty strong message in the prairies you wonder what it will look like under a new leader aaron O'Toole, Jason, what does he bring to the table that Andrew Scheer didn't? And what have you seen in the early stages of his leadership that, that gives you optimism, if you're optimistic? I'm optimistic about Mr. O'Toole generally, because I think he's he's really good. He is a step up from Mr. Scheer. That, that's that's clear. Uh, Mr. Scheer, you know, nice guy. But uh, I think, you know, when you look back, and I think even, you know, those of us that had watched him closely for years in Ottawa, 
couldn't really explain himself that well. And he hadn't really grown into the job that, that not much. And he really wasn't willing to work, put in the work, my judgment as well, from, from a lot of the, 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 the folks that I know who were very close to him. And, and just, you know, like, you know, he, he fundamentally got sort of the last 10 days of that last campaign, Trudeau, it, it could have gone either way. Uh, Trudeau stiffened his spine. And again, uh, probably not a lot of your listeners and me, I, I'm not big fans of Mr. Trudeau. In fact, I've spent most of my life trying to campaign against him. But, uh, you know, the truth is he stiffened his spine and won that election in the last 10 days. He looked like he wanted it more. And so, um, you know, Mr. O'Toole, when you fast forward to sort of Mr. O'Toole, he's not going to sort of wilt, I don't think, like Mr. Shear did in the last 10 days of that campaign. And and, and he did do so. so sadly, I, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say. So, you know, for former military, uh, family guy who, you know, sort of looks like the neighbor who you might, you know, borrow some extra charcoal or a propane tank if you run out your barbecue runs out of gas or whatever, like, you know, looks like the guy who might be out there shoveling your laneway when you get home, sort of pleasant surprise. Hey, Aaron, how's it going? Which is, I think, a nice uh, sort of change. He's not going to set the world on fire in terms of being, you know, sort of excitement. He's, uh, you know, he's a good, solid dude with a military background and a good, solid family. So what am I excited about? I'm excited about him because, uh, you know, he's the kind of leader that I think most of the conservative movement, uh, you know, won't be embarrassed to knock on a door and say, hey, we really think you should think about endorsing this guy or supporting him. I think that's half the battle in an election campaign. The things that I'm pessimistic, though, about, I do have to be honest on this, Ryan. And, and again, like, sorry to deliver bad news to your listeners so early in the morning. But, you know, it's, it's uh, again, governments win, generally win re-elections in these kinds of scenarios. Uh, Mr. Trudeau, uh, his numbers are a little bit better than they were before. Uh, there's, you know, if vac- vaccines are the big sort of, uh, you know, if, if the mood gets better in terms of vaccines in the spring, I worry about us. And it's nothing to do with Mr. O'Toole. It's everything to do with does the government, you know, sort of have one more election in them? Does Mr. Trudeau have one more election in them at the end of this pandemic? And I, I fear that that's the case. Um, but we're going to give it a hell of a go. And, and Ms., Mr. O'Toole, he's an improvement and he's a better leader and he will be a better leader than Mr. Uh, Mr. Shear was. I think it's safe to say that I, I want to at least touch on the fact that I, I think that the, the federal NDP is, is, is more hamstrung this election. Uh, than in the previous one, and that's saying something. It's a party that's vulnerable right now. It'll be interesting to see what happens in some of the ridings that may swing there. Uh, Jason, let me ask you about the tone. I think this is important. Um, you know, uh, messaging like we saw on the, on the conservatives website the other day, uh, this one here, it's since actually been pulled down, but I think it's relevant to take a look at, you know, Justin Trudeau is rigging the next election in his favor. We've We've seen when 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 messaging like that gets really ramped up, you know, you've 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 got the surge on the Capitol building. Right. I mean, when it really ramps up, Aaron O'Toole, through the course of his uh, campaign, seeking the leadership, talked about taking back Canada, for example. Uh, are you concerned about this, who it panders to the message it sends to moderates, to urban voters? Yeah, I, of course I am, because um, because, you know, so I, I'm sitting right now in a in a suburb of Toronto and I got to tell you, uh, anything that sounds like uh, U.S. Republican rhetoric right now is an, like it's it's, you know, f- full Heisman. I, I don't want to hear that uh, kind of stuff. And after what's happened over the last week, like so Trump, listen, you're in Alberta. Uh, I've been to Alberta, you know, a number of times in the last year. And, and I spent a lot of time out there two, three, four years ago. And, uh, you know, like every month and, 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 and you know, Trump's a little bit different, uh, you know, sort of. But he would still Trump would still lose an election in Alberta, probably like at that point, like which is which is, you know, sort of shocking to say. And, and um, I will say this, uh, the kind of rhetoric that you're talking about there, rigged elections. Number one, we don't have rigged elections in, in, in Canada. Number one. Number two, we have paper ballots in a, in a ballot box that you can count and there's scrutineers there. And the one thing that we've got and neither side ever. And I, I attack the liberals. This is the, and I attack the liberals when they said st- things like this, too. And that's again, we talked about bullshit earlier, Ryan, the problem that we've got that we're never going to get credit for. But the liberals have been spending a lot of time on this, too. The liberals in the United States called Trump's uh, election rigged uh, for four years there, you know, and, and no one's ever going to talk about that anymore. Uh, the liberals but not on the same level. I mean, I don't, I don't no, I'm, no. I'm here to be fair, but I'm not even close. No, no, I, I agree. But, you know, R- Russia got him elected. Russia got him elected. Russia sure. got him elected. Listen, I hate, I Which hate, might I be hate true. Donald Trump. I, I, exactly. I, but I'm not a, I'm not a fan. But the problem is that talk on both sides gets you to a spot where you are at right now, where there's no integrity or no confidence in the integrity of the system. And I'm here to tell sort of everybody, the Canadian electoral system is like it's as good as it's the gold standard. And I just I will not 
uh, you know, listen to any talk like that. It's paper ballots in a box that we can count afterwards and you can verify. It's one of the reasons why, you know, you see all this stuff with Dominion voting machines and, you know, that kind of stuff, Ryan, I'm sure you're seeing that from the United States. And, and listen, I've, I've seen these, these, these machines, but I will say we've had a couple of party leadership can contests that were close and, you know, uh, you know, you, the ballots get destroyed and they get counted by a machine and all that kind of stuff. And the problem is I've seen it myself where people don't trust it. And so I think we got to get back to basics on this stuff. And, uh, and I, that's one of the reasons why I'll, I'll online voting, no paper ballots in a box that you can count. And, uh, then there can be essentially no doubt. Jason Leader is the president of Enterprise Canada, former senior advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and several conservative premiers. Uh, great to have you on the show. Looking forward to our next conversation. Let me actually find something. I want to read this to you before we go. This is a, a, a feedback I think you'll appreciate from from Mayor Blaine, who's watching in this morning. He says, uh, you know, the gentleman talking politics with Jesperson right now seems to understand the politics of today. Uh, Blaine says, my issue is the politics of today. We don't have to continue down this path. We can expect more. That from Mayor Blaine. He says, less party politics, more accountability. Interesting stuff. Thanks for getting us focused. Eyes on the prize, Jason, and have a great rest of your week. Yeah, I mean, the key is don't hate your opponents and uh, be nice to each other, and we'll have a better politics, that's for sure. You can be tough, but you don't have to be an asshole. There you go. Be tough, don't be an asshole. From Jason Leader, appreciate that. You know, you hear, you'd hear stories of, of, of politicians, you know, across party lately, they would just at, they, would, they, would, they would battle uh, vociferously. You know, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of, you know, an example here in Alberta. I mean, uh, you know, for, for our viewers, audience outside of Alberta, the names may not mean something to you, but in Alberta for a long time, the leader of the New Democrats was Brian Mason. Uh, Brian Mason was the guy that would go to the wall for the new for the fledgling New Democrats when they were when they were a, a small but mighty caucus of four uh, from four to fifty four. Can you imagine in the twenty fifteen election under the leadership of Rachel Notley? But Brian Mason back in the day would would work like hell. Uh, to get the attention of Albertans uh, trying to draw attention to the NDP and what they were doing. And that oftentimes included some pretty sharp tongue rhetoric focused at the government. The government at the time included, you know, at that time, uh, Deputy Premier Thomas Lukasik, who was a senior cabinet minister under several premiers. And uh, and, and Mason and Lukasik would just you like the, the, the war of words was wonderful as a pundit because it was just like soundbite after soundbite. And then you find out these guys would walk out of the legislative assembly and they'd go grab beers together. And that, that may not be realistic all the time. And in all circumstances, I can guarantee you uh, that Jason Kenney and Rachel Notley or that Aaron O'Toole and Justin Trudeau are definitely not having backyard barbecues together. <laughs> Sam's chuckling over here. Yeah, I, I, I even know that like Rachel Notley and Brian Jean got along on a very good personal level. And a lot of respect yeah, for each other. Exactly. And and you saw that, I think, too. I mean, and obviously, I mean, the, sort of a, a real obvious example would have been during the wildfires in Fort McMurray, where they, they were working to cooperate. And, you know, the, the, basically, Brian Jean's backyard, I mean, his, 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 what, a, what an absolutely brutal year that was for, for Brian to lose his son to a horrific illness, to lose his home to, I mean, geez. And I know that, you know, the people of Fort McMurray, that's going to be something that you, you'll go, well, I can tell you my story. And there, there's thousands of them. The point just being, sometimes I think it's important to be able to, to see people from, from different walks of life, different backgrounds, different political, uh, you know, affiliations or, you know, different teams uh, come together and be civil to one another and participate in civil conversations. You don't have to agree on a sales tax. You don't have to agree on carbon pricing. You don't have to agree on what government tax breaks or business incentives should look like. You don't have to agree on universal income, basic income. But we can at least agree that, you know, I think that that we expect our politicians and, and, and we expect ourselves to be able to to participate in productive conversation to move the ball forward and to to benefit all of us, right? I mean, I, I, we're not talking about reinventing the wheel here. Uh, we're talking about basic civility in politics. Sean says Brian Jean is the type of principled, honest person that should be leading the conservatives. Um, Ken says, I disagree with Brian on so many things, but he's leagues better than Jason Kenney. The man has principles. Um David says conservatives were so embarrassed by their rigged election campaign that they took it off the Internet. Uh, they're never going to win with American style hate campaigns. David's talking about that image. Can you show it to me one more time, Sam? This is what we're talking about. This was pulled from the conservative. It was up there, I think, for like a day or something like that until there was real pushback, including I saw in my circles pushback from conservatives going uh, like rigging the next election. Now, what this is all talking about is, is sort of this this pre-writ period where 
you know, there are spending implications for what opposition parties can do, what the government can do. Governments of all stripes do this. Uh, governments of all uh, political affiliations do this at different levels. Before they call an election, officially before the writ drops, they'll go and announce spending everywhere, right? Oh, there's a there's a key riding over here we think we can steal or 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 the polling is showing us we might have a tough time hanging on to it. New school, right? These are the types of things, right? Oh, there's an industry that's kind of ticked off at us. New cash infusion. And then a month later, Canadians go to the polls. We, we see it all the time. Uh, so the conservatives are touching on that. But 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 I think to use the language of Justin Trudeau is rigging the next election as people are smashing out windows at the Capitol and five people wind up dead uh, might be a bit of a moment of 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 of, of tone deaf communications. And I think that, you know, I mean, there are there are groups here, I think, that that have opportunity uh, to advance their messaging and to glean support from Canadians. And I think that although Jason touched on it, it is tough to knock off an incumbent in circumstances like this. The government's going to come out and say, listen, Yes, we are all in this together. You know, Justin Trudeau will... I don't know if I want to get into the Trudeau impression right now. I'm working on it. But he'll talk about how the government recognized that they needed to be there for Canadians and, and they needed to step up immediately. And yes, there were some bumps along the road along the way, but most importantly, they had the, the interests of individuals and small businesses at heart because they're the party of small business and they're the party of middle class Canadians and they're the party. And then the conservatives will say, no, we're the party of middle class Canadians and we're the ones that will fight and take back government. And this and then all the messaging happens. Right. I fear for the for the conservatives that. They're going to go down a path, the easy path of trying to secure the votes that they already have. You know, banging the drum that Justin Trudeau's rigging the next election and convincing people that ultimately what you're saying is that the results are going to be invalid. It's going to get you a lot of play in rural communities on the prairies where you don't even need to campaign. You're already going to win those seats. It's going to turn people off. It's going to turn people off in Vancouver and Toronto and Montreal and Quebec City and Halifax just a word to the wise. You can let me know what you think about this. Am I bang on? Am I, am I out to lunch? The hashtag is Real Talk RJ. Our next guest, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Mariah Braun, a, a filmmaker, a, a content creator, um, and a Guyanese Canadian born and raised. Uh, it, it's Grand Prairie, right? Is it Grand Prairie that you're, you're chiming in from this morning, Mariah? Yes. Yeah, I live in Grand Prairie, Alberta. We're about four and a half hours north of Edmonton. Well, thank you so much for being here on, on Real Talk today. Um, you and I have been communicating. I mean, social media is amazing and bringing people together that otherwise may not meet. And, and you and I, our paths crossed as as we and as Albertans were discussing a troubling image. I'm, I'm obviously going to show it right now to provide the context of, of what we're talking about. This was an image that was uh, shot allegedly outside of a Grimshaw, Alberta, the post office, the Canada post office. Uh, you have to assume it was some person's interpretation of expressing themselves about mask laws, mask public health requirements, obviously being condemned by people uh, quite rightfully describing it and condemning it as a, a hate symbol. You yourself uh, had had this, I, I suppose, drop right in front of you. Uh, can you provide us the background on on your experience here as a result of this image? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was Friday night. I was just hanging out on social media and this image came across my screen and it instantly made me ill. Like, I just don't even know how else to describe it. Um, that symbolizes just hate towards a certain group of people. Um, I just happened to be, you know, one of those people. Um, I think it should outrage um, not only people of color, but everyone. And there were um, a number of people on this thread that were somehow defending this as, you know, he's doing his civil rights and wearing a mask and a mask is a mask. And um, this mask looks good to me. And I just, I don't think that those are uh, comments that um, should be defended. And frankly, they're offensive to me. And I know they're offensive to a lot of other Albertans. Can you give us a sense of, I mean, this Facebook group that you're talking about where this post was, was it like a geographical group? Was it like residents of Northern Alberta? What, what was this group? Yeah, it's, uh, it's called the real Grand Prairie. It's a private group. And to be honest, uh, 
it's kind of a group where there is a lot of ugly things that happen. Um, I've gone through moments in time where I just had to erase that group and, you know, go on with my life. But, you know, I happen to be subscribed to it right now. So, um, yeah, I saw it and I was just, I was floored at the response from people. Um, I had someone tell me uh, directly to me, it's just a mask and you're reading too much into it. People and, uh, can't I be am... serious, Mariah. People can't seriously <laughs> yeah. be saying this. I mean, that's that's an insult to their own intelligence to state the very obvious. Yeah, you know, I, I too was like, is this real life? Like almost every day of 2021 so far, I've been asking myself this. And, you know, it's, it's sad because I know I'm never going to get through to someone like that. And um, I had to just end the conversation on my own terms because... I, I just, I don't want to subscribe to that kind of communication from people and that kind of uh, discussion. So Mariah, when you say that, you know, you said you've seen things like this before and you've left this Facebook group before and then, you know, for whatever reason, been drawn back in, uh, probably you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a curious citizen, you're an engaged citizen, but, but you see incident after incident. Um, as a woman, as a visible minority in Northern Alberta, I mean, when you talk about you've seen this before, are you talking about uh, racialized situations like this or situations targeting racialized Canadians? I, you know, I have seen, I've seen things throughout our community over the years. I, I like to say um, they are racist events that I have experienced. So um, it goes back even to childhood on the playground where I've been called a racial slur, um, you know, and you kind of wonder how does a kid know what? Uh, to say those things to me. Uh, I've also seen uh, people fly, like recently, this is current, people flying the rebel flag from the back of their, their trucks um, or, you know, those, those license plates. Uh, you know, I, I've experienced walking down the street uh, to my job as a teenager, you know, people yelling racial slurs to me. And, and you know, this, this doesn't happen to me every day. And I love my community. I, I know there's a lot of great people in Grand Prairie and in Northern Alberta and all over Alberta, but these things do still happen. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, this is Canada. These type of things don't happen, but they do. And, and they might not happen to everyone. And, and maybe it happens more frequently to other people of color. I can't, I can't speak on behalf of everyone, but these are the kind of things that I've experienced living in Northern Alberta. What was looking back on 2020, um, a significant, I mean, the year just can, I mean, if you take a look at, you know, we talked about flight PS 752 last week, that, that, that airline that was shot down. And then we look at the, I mean, the, the killing of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the black lives matter rallies around the world. We look at the global pandemic. I mean, there were so many stories that will define that year for so many years to come. What, what was the experience like for you in 2020 as a black woman in Northern Alberta as those Black Lives Matter demonstrations played out uh, in communities, including here in Canada? Yeah, so in, in Grand Prairie, we did have a Black Lives Matter uh, rally. Um, it was organized by um, two youth um, and, a, well, actually four youth in total. Um, and, you know, I, th I believe there's about a thousand people there and there was multiple demonstrations. You know, I'm seeing support. I'm seeing uh, a difference being made. There's just still those voices that seem to be loud online. And um, yeah, it's just, they just seem louder than everyone else. And I think we just need to change that by having discussions like this. And, you know, there is a lot of negativity uh, around Black Lives Matter. And, you know, I, I, I kind of lent a hand in creating some posters for the youth because they had little to no resources. Um, when they when they started the rally and they needed some of that help and there is a negative um, you know there are people that think negatively about Black Lives Matter in the community but again I do think that we are making a lot of progress and Grand Prairie in general there is a lot of supportive people here.
So ultimately, when you, I mean, I, I commend you, Mariah, for, for your willingness to come on here and talk about this and talk about your firsthand experience. What, what, what do you want to remind people or what's the message that you want to send to your fellow Canadians, the, the thousands of them that are either watching or listening right now or they're going to be listening to the podcast or watching this on YouTube later? What's your message? I would probably say look, listen to yourself and, and see what kind of role you're playing in your community. Are you unifying people or are you dividing people? Are you looking at solutions or are you, are you creating problems? Um, I think, I think a lot of these people, they just have, they're set in their minds. And I, I hope one day that they can reflect and, and look back at these kind of things that they're saying on these threads and, and maybe change a little bit. Um, and, just accept people um, for any kind of difference that they might have. Don't single them out. Don't make them feel unsafe by by wearing a, a hood. Like, what is this? Like, can like, you be- this is? Can you believe you even have to say that? <laughs> like, you know, I, yeah. I would I would I would suggest that you know you you never you never know what you have to say. But I would say I would have thought that in 2021 we were beyond having to say, hey, the the mask bylaw excludes you know, Ku Klux Klan hoods for anybody that would have like, I mean, I'm laughing, but it's not funny, but like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I just, you know, you, you sort of wonder sometimes. And, and I think what it is, um, there, there's an anti-racism advocate here in Edmonton by the name of Jesse Lipscomb that started up a movement that's simply centered around making it on making it awkward. He says, make it awkward, have these awkward conversations. Now I know it's a lot to ask for some people, to be in a scenario where they may feel intimidated or they may feel that they don't have a voice or they may feel that they're in hostile territory. They may feel alone on an island. Um, I was talking to a friend the other day. He's remarkable. We're going to have him on the show in weeks to come. He's, he's, he's working on a, on a program for young black entrepreneurs because he says that growing up as a, as a, as a young black man, that there was nobody. He would look in boardrooms or he'd, he'd, he'd be at a, at a practicum yeah. or an internship and he'd look around the room. You look like you've had the same experience. He's, he said he would never see, there'd never be another black person in the room. And he's talking about the importance yeah. of changing that. Have you, I, I imagine you've had the same experience based on your body language. Yeah. Yeah. So growing up in Grand Prairie, um, when I was young, I would, I would probably say like literally there was three other, you know, colored, um, families, uh, in school. Um, the only other, uh, visible minority, um, was actually mistaken as my brother just because he was, he was black. Um, Jeez. we're not related at all, but like it, it just happens. And, you know, over, over time, Grand Prairie has become a lot more diverse over the years. We, you know, we've seen a lot more people, um, you know, migrating here because of work and different reasons. So it is a diverse community today, but yeah, I, I've had, I mean, that's what I experience here. I, I'm usually the only black person uh, in the room for the most part. And I know the city is doing a lot of work. There are more and more groups that are um, gathering together to create change. Um, so that's exciting. That's exciting to see. Even seeing a thousand people show up for the Black Lives Matter really moved me. Um, it, I never thought that I would see that here in Grand Prairie. Like, it's so silly for me to say that. I don't know why, but it's it was incredible to see that amount of support. And, you know, I've lived here my entire life and um, just, just seeing that there are people in my corner. um, That was, that was incredible. Mariah Braun uh, is uh, a born and raised Grand Prairie resident, a marketing professional entrepreneur and filmmaker. You know what you've just said there? I mean, I know this isn't profound, um, but, but you just saying how much that meant to you to see a thousand people, you're sending a very clear message to those thousand people. Right. And also to those that weren't there that would have been there in spirit or were there in spirit um, about drawing people together. And I think it's these types of conversations that are so important, Mariah, as we strengthen the community. No shortage of things to talk about in Grand Prairie right now with with MLA Tracy Allard and everything else going on. Thanks for making time for us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ryan. Yeah, you bet. You can follow Mariah on Twitter, by the way, at Mariah B. 
creates uh, every day right around, you know, 8, 8, 15, 8, 20. I live my life in ish, Sam, don't I? Around 8, 15, ish, uh, ish, <laughs> it will send out a list on my Twitter and then my Instagram on Insta story of who the guests are that are coming up so you can keep an eye on them. Uh, we're going to be talking about this mask procurement story uh, busted out by the Breakdown podcast in just a second. Right now, wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we're proud to be repping Westworld computers. That's what powers Real Talk each and every morning. Daryl and his team make sure that we're well equipped to do the job that we need to do. That includes the, the brand new iPad. I've got the iPhone 11 Pro Max, the MacBook Pros, the iMac. I think we've got pretty much the entire lineup covered, Sam. Uh, and it, yeah, see, we get yeah, to go to Camera 4 to show it off, There's not too. much in their store that isn't in this room already. Do you think, <laughs> do you think anybody's <laughs> noticed that we really tidied up in here? I hope that folks have noticed. Did you notice our, that Our we, neighbor Jenny did. She knows that we tied it up. Oh, I thought you meant she tied it up, and I was about no. to say, no, 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 no. Hey, no, no, we, no, we, did we, the we need all the credit here. Yeah. You know, we even separated garbage and recycling, you know, for two dudes. That's pretty good. <laughs> Back to Westworld Computers. Grateful to have them here, not just on the sales side, but the service side as well. That's their bread and butter. They've been doing it for more than 40 years, locally owned. Check them out at Westworld Computers off Mayfield Road. Also very proud to be partnered up with, I mean, we don't pick favorites, but if we did, I'm just going to say one of them would be Dairy Queen. The Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, an unbelievable team uh, owned and operated by Mark and Michael, a couple of swell guys that are proud to give back to the communities that they serve. Right now, Real Talkers, so many of you are showing up and saying hello to their six locations they want to let you know that if you pick up a box of six dilly bars pick up a second one because there's a two for one deal for all the real talkers and they have dairy free dilly bars now at dairy queen how amazing is that Let's get to this next story. This is one that was uh, uh, reported yesterday. We're going to give the breakdown credit for this. They're the ones that did the digging. They're the ones that made the freedom of information request. You can find them at the breakdown AB. Talked about it briefly yesterday, but we want to talk to people whose lives are impacted by, well, basically what's being described as corruption, nepotism, as Alberta's education minister who has been out of the landscape and out of the public eye for a number of weeks now, despite the fact that kids went back to school yesterday. Uh, emails have surfaced the breakdown reporting them. You can find it online. You can watch their podcast for all the details showing that the minister or people tied to the ministry meddled in the mask procurement process. Here's the deal. Four companies were identified. Uh, Old Navy was one of them. And this next company, Unbelts, we're going to talk about a great success story, a great entrepreneurial story was one of the others. A great opportunity for these four companies to step up and fill the order uh, to fulfill the promise that the province had made, that every student was going to get two masks. The province had to go find millions of masks. Well, the education minister wound up ensuring that a contract worth about 700 grand went to a friend of hers, a donor of hers, despite the fact they weren't on the list. Now, who was on the list, as mentioned, was Unbelts. Unbelts is owned by Claire Theaker Brown, a uh, born and raised Edmontonian who graduated from the University of Alberta Industrial Design and East Asian Studies program. She lived in Shanghai for about six years. That's where she launched the company Unbelts, an ethical manufacturer of size inclusive genderless accessories, including cloth masks. Good time to be in that line of work. Unbelts is a certified B Corporation. Claire, a passionate advocate for equitable entrepreneurship and sustainable apparel manufacturing. Welcome to Real Talk. Thanks for making time for us. Well, thanks for making time for us. Claire, these are these are the types of stories where we can really get into the weeds and the average person will go, okay, I'm getting kind of lost in all the details. Why does this matter? What's the deal? What are the Coles notes? Take us into it from your perspective. Sure. So you're absolutely right. There are a lot of angles to this story. Um, but I think the I think what I am seeing um, from the messages that I'm getting on my Twitter and you know what's out there on Reddit um, and the interwebs in general is that Albertans are really upset that uh, that a um, project for the government to procure millions of masks for Albertan school kids um, was started really late at the end of July, early August for a September school reentry. Um, that the uh, that there was never a public uh, request for proposals um, for Alberta companies to apply for. Um, and at the end of the day, the project, which was worth a lot of money, was awarded to um, to two companies, one Old Navy with no ties to Alberta, and the second, and this is where the story has really come out this week, um, a an Alberta company um, who wasn't actually part of the 
uh, who wasn't one of the companies um, that the emergency procurement center um, had put forth to the government. So it looks like there was a, a supplier who kind of got to skip the line a bit um, and was awarded a contract. And um, what we're seeing is that that is really upsetting Albertans. Yeah, to say the least, uh, some interesting developments since the breakdowns reported this. Um, and I think it's worth noting as well that the minister uh, for the past number of months has claimed that her office or she in particular did not involve themselves in the mask procurement process. Emails indicate that that is simply not true. It also means it's calling into question the Minister of Education's testimony to the ethics commissioner in the province of Alberta. Um, but you're a business person. And this represented a pretty huge opportunity. I mean, to the tune of if, if you would have been awarded the entire contract, millions of dollars or even a portion of the contract, hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is significant to any small business owner. Uh, so let me ask you the, the question that, that the psychologist might. How does this make you feel? <laughs> sure. Well, you know, uh, of, of course, it was a little bit of a... Of course, it was a little bit of a heartbreaker, um, you know, managing this year as a small business owner has been absolutely wild. And we introduced masks back in the spring um, because we needed a survival strategy. We didn't know what the rest of the year would bring. Um, we, uh, But we did know that we had suppliers that we needed to keep in business um, if we weren't going to be placing as many belt orders. And we also knew that we had a team that we needed to keep employed. Um, we tried a million cloth masks on the market. We didn't find any that we thought were uh, comfortable enough. And so we wanted to make the best, most comfortable ones we could. So it was it was exciting to be tapped. We got a call on a Wednesday, um, July 29th, and were asked to submit a proposal that Friday. Uh, we were asked um, how many masks uh, no, we weren't asked how many masks. We were asked uh, how long it would take us to manufacture and deliver a million masks. And we were asked to come to a particular price point, asked to submit a proposal if we could meet that. Um, and so it took a lot of legwork. You know, we aren't uh, we aren't a teeny business, but we're not a huge business either. Um, our regular mask orders are five to 10,000 pieces. So for us to figure out um, the logistics, um, like the really boring nuts and bolts <laughs> uh, details behind making a million masks, um, you know, it, it takes work. So luckily we're connected directly with our suppliers right down to the materials. So it involved a lot of phone calls to fabric suppliers, um, to our sewing studios, um, to our shippers, our customs brokers, our banks to uh, to finance the deposits we would have to give to our suppliers on that scale. And so to put in all that legwork um, and to courier samples across town um, to the emergency procurement uh, committee and um, to be on call, you know, back and forth, you know, can we change our design to do ear loops? Yes, we can. Here's a photo of what that would look like and go back and forth and then to find, to not be awarded the contract that was, you know, fair play. There was, there were no guarantees. Um, were we given this, the sense that if we were able to meet the price and the timelines that we would have a really strong chance of being awarded the contract. Yes, we were definitely given that impression, but we weren't given any guarantees. Um, what is really troubling, I think, as again, as a small medium business owner, is to find out that those days and, and nights, because um, again, we're operating across time zones, um, talking to our uh, material suppliers, um, that you know they weren't really worth anything. That uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't seem like our proposal uh, was ever really maybe given fair consideration because where the contract went, it doesn't seem like it had anything to do with pricing because our, our price no. was lower um, quality because we know that our quality, uh, you know, based on what customers received, um, we we know that our quality is higher um, and even and even safety. You know, um, we put a lot of research and followed all the scientific evidence available to develop our masks. And it's really disappointing that the gen that was finally offered to Alberta school kids was um, 
was not uh, was not in line with the uh, with the fit recommendations that are out there. Um, yeah, you know, this is Claire. This is I would think like if I'm advising government on communications here, if I'm you know writing the news release or acting as a press secretary, I'd say, well, yeah. I mean, it's easy to dismiss a lot of what you're saying by by simply you know recognizing that the general public does not know how this process works so you know they would say mm-hmm. you know ms theaker brown uh while we appreciate her submission uh is perhaps unaware of the timeline under which we were operating and it was simply not feasible to be able to yada 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 and they, they I, I think that, that it yeah. could be easily dismissed because members of the public don't really understand how the mechanisms work but when you consider how many boxes you ticked Right. Better quality, lower price manufactured here. I mean, let me let me ask you that for for an example. And, and I'm not the type sure. of person that, that's going to be so naive to suggest that that every time that, that the government procures anything, that there's never going to be any work that's farmed out uh, to other jurisdictions, whatever the case may be. There will be hundreds of examples where that is the case. But but these masks were not made in Alberta when some of them could have been or made in Canada, for that matter. Um does that play into part of your frustration here? Is that an angle that you think people should be focusing on where the masks were made? Because on one hand, you can say you're supporting an Alberta company, but there are Alberta companies that import and there are Alberta companies that manufacture. Absolutely. And to be clear, we're an Alberta company that does both. Um, Mm -hmm. We've got studios here and we've got a studio where I started the business in South China. Um, That's not outsourcing to us. We're a certified B corporation. Um, We've got ethical standards around the factories that we work with. And we only operate with small family owned studios that pay living wages and extraordinary benefits. So we've got twin studios, two different geographies, exactly the same labor standards and that was part of the proposal that we offered um but uh but you know it wasn't um the ethical manufacturing was not one of the boxes that uh, that needed to be ticked um and in terms of whether or not in terms of whether or not uh we should have included alberta manufacturers of course we should have um and on and i think the real the the real mistake here was not choosing uh, was not that the government did not choose an Alberta manufacturer in August when there were three weeks to deliver on uh, to deliver a million masks. Um, the real problem is that this project wasn't started early enough for this to be a real Alberta made success story. And I'm not a part of I'm not a part of the government's uh, communications team either. But from my perspective. There was just an incredible story um, to tell here about um, advanced planning, knowing that Albertans are anxious about back to school, knowing that back to school happens in September every year, um, and being able to plan in advance to say, okay, we're going to need a lot of masks, and we have um, you know over 40 Alberta businesses who have pivoted to masks, whether they are making them in Alberta, whether they are ethically making them in higher volumes overseas. Let's see how let's see how Alberta companies how we can support Alberta companies coming together um, to meet this demand. I'll just add, um, you know, one question that we are asked a lot is, well, could you even have produced that quantity? Um, Because there was a statement that came out um, from the government early August, which to me was such a gut punch after we had submitted a proposal for being able to deliver 600,000 masks in four weeks with an additional 400,000 masks in an additional week. So that's a million masks by September 10th, 600,000 masks by August 31st. And there was a statement that came out of the government's um, government's office saying uh, saying that, you know, we just can't work with all these local suppliers, you know, doing 10 10,000 masks, 20,000 masks at a time, that's not feasible. And, um, you know, I'm not talking about cobbling together uh, 5,000 masks, 6,000 masks at a time. I'm, I'm talking about pulling together Alberta businesses who have really put their backs into um, into making their businesses sustainable this year with their mask offerings and saying, okay, who can do 100,000? Who can do 500,000? And just giving it the, you know, even another four to six weeks, I think would have made that possible. Um, and what a success story that would have been for the government 
that would have been um, just a really, uh, just a really wonderful PR opportunity, honestly, that every Alberta school kid and every Alberta family would know that their mask was made by an Alberta company, that the government spending was benefiting Albertans. And um, it may have cost a little bit more to, uh, to support local companies, but I, uh, but I, I, I don't think that anyone really has a lot of patience to hear about, um, you know, why the government needed to save a couple million dollars on masks for school kids when there has been such, um, when there has uh, been such high spending in other areas. Yeah, so, I mean, especially if the masks are lousy. It's, it's interesting because I know that, uh, you know, the, the education minister's uh, press secretary, who is one of the, uh, you know, staffers implicated in the travel scandal, by the way. So I don't know if he was responding from Hawaii or back here in Alberta, but but had had sort of noted that that, uh, you know, this is an Alberta company, the, the company in Red Deer that that procured the masks. And 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 it's unfortunate that people are pointing. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, unfortunate that people are are assuming that just because the mask company or the company, the suppliers in the same city as the minister's riding, that there would be some form of nepotism. And it's, it's just I mean, the the receipts here uh, are undeniable, which I think shows that the ministry is doubling down, which should be equally as troubling for Albertans as, as perhaps the story itself. Sure. Now, what I have found interesting is that people that have been in touch with us, including other garment manufacturers, by the way, Claire, that said, we'd like you to have background yeah. information here, but we don't want you to use our name and we don't want to do the interview, have noted that that it's it's actually that this company in Red Deer, they've said, we don't, we don't have any problem with that company. Uh, no, as, no as, one has as, a problem with that company. Nobody has. As a matter of fact, it's owned by a prominent Red Deer family that is that mm-hmm. I know is very well respected in the community. Uh, a lot of civic involvement. It's, it's one of those names. You know, every city has like their family names. When you drop that name, this is one of those names. And so everyone's tried to be really careful, saying we're not picking a fight with that mask manufacturer. We're just unhappy with how the procurement process went. Does that yes. kind of describe how you're feeling? Yes, it does. Um, I think what is so what is so frustrating here is uh, is, again, that missed opportunity. Um, this was an obvious project that uh, deserved a longer timeline. A longer timeline was absolutely possible. September comes at the same time every year. Uh, and I, uh, I, I agree. Nobody has a problem with that supplier. I think uh, where Albertans are con- concerned um, is that there uh, is that, you know, the goal here really should have been um, providing the safest the safest masks for school kids and for teachers. Um, and there was really an opportunity to do uh, to do some really good work by Alberta businesses that have been struggling this year. And as one of the four businesses, um, you know, not including Old Navy, one of the three Alberta businesses that was included in that shortlist and the only one that does our own manufacturing of masks, um, you know, what I can say is that it uh, it really did not feel supportive um, of small businesses to ask us on an extraordinarily tight timeline to put together a very ambitious proposal, um, and handling the back and forth and, uh, and doing all of that legwork. If we never really had a chance at winning that contract, um, I've got a team to, I've got a team to keep employed. I have masks and I have belts to sell. Um, I have, uh, you know, I have a million things on my, on my to-do list. So, um, you know, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the chance to bid on a project. And if I don't get accepted for it, fair play. But um, if you're asking for an application that is going to be um, that's going to be put to the side when a donor emails in, um, you know, please, like, please respect my time. Just just let us know. Just 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 put a little note right at the top that that simply says if there are any party donors that happen to enter the mix, we will be favoring them. So save So just be aware. That would be it'd be nice to let everybody right. know ahead of time. Right. Let, let me ask you this in seriousness. Uh, and people can check out unbelts.com. I also have to note how liberating it is. It's 10 oh seven. We haven't done the 10 o'clock news yet. And nobody minds. This is just the new reality. Oh. That I just absolutely <laughs> well. love. We would have had to stop 10 minutes ago if we were on the uh, doing the other show. Uh, but. But, but let me. I, my my understanding is that um, in closing, and please d- don't be modest, don't be shy. That's annoying on a talk show. Pump your tires. Tell us the stories. My understanding is that there there was an opportunity for some for some good news stories here, uh, including masks that you were able to make available over the past number of months. 
Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So, you know, the really the happy ending for us at Unbelts was that, you know, we did this legwork and we realized, wow, okay, you know, we can, we can come up with enormous volumes of masks um, on really short turnarounds if we need to. Um, our suppliers were there to meet us. And so although we didn't have the budget that a government PO would have offered, um, we did call out to our customers and say, look, we know that two masks per student student is not going to be enough in September. We also know that not every family can do laundry on a daily basis. Alberta school kids are going to need more masks. So will you help us? Let's do a buy one, give one um, mask, uh, mask raiser for Alberta kids. And we kicked that campaign off with a donation of 5,000 masks ourselves. And then our customers, um, helped us get to 20,000 masks and we were able to donate those all over Alberta. Um, and the emails and the cute crayon drawn cards um, from kids, you know, all over the province, like that has been extraordinary. Uh, we also introduced a, an educator discount um, to go with our uh, frontline and uh, service workers discounts on our masks. And, you know, overall, it really put us in touch with what our goal was. Um, our goal isn't selling to government. Our goal is keeping kids safe. Mm. We are parents at Unbelts. Um, I have, uh, you know, two of our staff members, we've formed a, a learning cohort and we support each other's kids distance learning um, through this. We've got kids downstairs right now doing distance learning, which is why I'm huddled I, in I my I better let here. you go, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You've got crayon um, drawings so on your drywall right now. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, so no, it, it has, um, you know, overall this past year has been a great, a great success for us. Um, it has been a chance for our customers to, uh, to support us in ways that we had never asked them to before. And we are so, so grateful. Um, if you are out there with an unbelts mask on, thank you. There you go. Hey, all of us really quickly in closing, cause I've got another guest and I got to respect your time. And, and as mentioned, there may be masterpieces being drawn in crayon all over your house right now. I hope I'm not. <laughs> I hope I'm not manifesting that. Uh, if I am, I'll come help you scrub. Um, no, wait, we're not allowed to do that. Never mind. But Claire, uh, with, with with regards to mapping out your business and and planning ahead, um, I would obviously the, I don't know anything about your uh, you know how it, how it would work with regards to forecasts and the implications on manufacturing and importing and all these types of things. But but as an entrepreneur that's in the mask game, uh, we'll say in yeah. the P, in the PPE game to a certain degree. Um, how far, like, what's your personal gut feeling on what the market for masks is going to look like over the next one to 18 months? Like how far yeah. ahead or how many masks are you manufacturing for the next however many months? Yeah. So, you know, we're still manufacturing in the thousands. There's a lot of education work that needs to be done um, for our customers and for the general public, namely that if you are vaccinated, you still need to wear a mask because you can still transmit um, COVID-19. So as long as we're doing that education work, uh, we do foresee strong sales this year. Uh, but absolutely, you know, our goal right now is to make sure that everyone that we've sold a mask to um, knows about our belts because that's that's our long-term game. Um, and, you know, guess what? We got into the business of really comfy, stretchy stuff that uh, that feels great on your body and helps you move. Well, uh, you know, we started doing that 10 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm only laughing because I, you stuff. know, you, you know that I have one of your belts and I'm only laughing be so I don't cry because I'm grateful that it's stretchy. Um, oh, because yeah, my, hello. it's like, oh, the boy. work from home belt, right? Oh, yeah. Boy. Don't button your jeans. No. no one needs that kind of judgment from their pants these no. days. Like <laughs> just get a stretch belt. <laughs> so I can attest to um, the, to the stretchiness of your belts. Well, thank you. Um, and listen, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going off the cuff here. Um, can I, can I set up a discount code for your people this week? Are you week? kidding me? Yeah, let's do it. Can Why I? Not? Yeah, of course okay. you can. Of course All right. you can. What is let's it? Let's just, let's just do it. Uh, let's do it. Ryan J. Yeah. Okay, and it'll be at um, unbelts.com or unbelts.ca. Yeah. Um, and it'll be 10% off your order. Boom. There you go. Awesome. Hey, thanks for making time for us. It's I I know that like I want to get you back on like an entrepreneur's roundtable and things and pick your brain on things that aren't related to political scandal or nepotism. Uh, <laughs> and, and just That'd talk and talk about growing business and empowering people and international collaborations and and your time well, in, in China. I mean, geez, six years you lived there full time. Um, but thanks for talking to us today, Claire, and taking time away from I know responsibilities on the home front plus running a business. You're a busy lady. 
Oh, we're all juggling these days. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for having me and have an awesome rest of your day. We will. That's Claire Theaker Brown. Uh, really appreciate Claire's voice on this. She's the founder of Unbelts. You can check him out unbelts.com or .ca. It'll redirect. There you go. Ryan J. The promo code 10% off. Um, She's smart. She's a smart lady. She knows what she's doing there. Um, we better pay a couple of bills. Oh, we're going to be introducing you into a really remarkable young woman in just a second who's using TikTok to impact change in her community. Um, community is what the team at Park Power is all about. You know, Park Power, they, they, they sort of, they were all over our radar when we started this show. Out of the gates, as a matter of fact, to this point, they're one of the only Real Talk Builders, in other words, sponsors that we have reached out to. The rest have come to us. We went to Park Power. I said, I love what you're doing. I love that you profit share with charities. I love that you're grassroots. I love that your call center is right here in Alberta. So if people are calling in from Strathcona County, they have a complaint about internet service in Strathcona County, they want to improve it with, well, you can talk to them with the knowledge of that community. And of course, the team at Park Power as well with a pretty awesome uh, carrot they're dangling in front of you, whether you're a residential scenario or a commercial, like a business scenario that we're talking about. The team at Park Power wants your business, electricity, natural gas, and internet. Use the promo code 2021-REALTALK. 2021-REALTALK at parkpower.ca. You'll save 70 bucks off your first bill. How cool is that? We're also really excited to be welcoming to the fold this month the team at Eden Landscaping. You know, this is the time of year. I know a lot of you are looking outside and you're starting to dream about the tulips popping up. And then some of your perennials are going to start. But you're going, what about the retaining wall? What about that, that, that sort of raised bed we've been talking about? Whether it's flower boxes or a total overhaul, the team at Eden Landscaping is ready to work with you. And they're pandemic friendly in the sense that they're conducting Zoom consultations. They can even check out the lay of your land, your property with Google Earth to make sure that you get your dream project done, check out landscapeedmonton.ca. Also thrilled to be partnering up this month with Amy. Who's Amy? Well, Amy is the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. They partner with companies of all sizes across industries to drive innovation strategy and provide practical guidance and advice. How much do you know about AI, artificial intelligence, let alone what it could do for your business? They work with big multinationals like Imperial Oil and Shell Scottford, all the way down to the little guys, the independent players. You can check them out online at Amy. That's A M I I dot C A. Sam, it's ten fifteen. Why don't we take a look at our ten fifteen newscast? So, a federal cabinet shuffle. Jason Leader, conservative strategist who joined us earlier this morning, saying he was a little caught off guard, a little surprised. Is it a harbinger? of an election to come most likely as Navdeep Bains uh, previously the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry says he won't run again. Uh, Jason says maybe it's because he didn't get that finance portfolio when Christian Freeland did. Uh, that means that Francois-Philippe Champagne moves from foreign affairs to innovation, means that Mark Garneau, former astronaut, former transportation minister, moves into the foreign affairs portfolio, and Omar Algabra moves into cabinet, as does Jim Carr, returning to cabinet as a special representative to the prairies. Speaking of the prairies, uh, prairie premiers, including Jason Kenney, saying, hey, listen, Ottawa, we're going to need more vaccines says Alberta's on its way to exhausting its supply as early as next week. The province announcing Monday it'll immediately expand its vaccination program to include paramedics and emergency medical responders. But the Premier, Kenny, saying that supplies are already precarious. Alberta projecting to be short at least 20,000 doses by next week, but it could be higher, that number, based on the pace of inoculations. And here's kind of a sad story out of the sporting world as the National Hockey League gets set to resume play tomorrow. It's shortened season. San Jose Sharks sniper Evander Kane uh, being sued, as is the San Jose Sharks organization for more than $8.3 million by Centennial Bank. Well, yesterday that story got even worse. Uh, the Athletic, uh, Daniel Kaplan, reporting that Kane has filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy with close to $27 million of debt. That includes that Centennial Bank amount. The bankruptcy petition states that Kane may opt out of the upcoming NHL season. 47 creditors named in the complaint include Scotiabank and Kane's former agency, Newport. Uh, the complaint also states that the hockey star lost a million and a half dollars in gambling in the last year alone. Uh, that reporting from The Athletic and San Jose Hockey Now. Always want to recognize our sources. 
We're going to be leaving some time. Uh, several of you, uh, including yesterday, Brandy reached out and said, hey, Ryan, I, I was one of the 4,300 plus people that, that contributed to your Real Talk question of the week, and, and, and I left a lengthy comment, and I was wondering if you were going to get to some of the comments. We are, and I want to get to some of the, you, you, I told you we had more than 300,000 words submitted. 300,000 words. I was talking to Chris Henderson at Y Station. I said, paint a picture for me of, of perspective. Like, what, it, what is 300,000 words? And he wrote me back and he said, well, the Great Gatsby is like 55,000. He said, Moby Dick is 206,000 words. So, so that gives you a bit of a mile marker on where real talkers were with regards to responding to this poll. We're going to get to that. And, and, and I want to uh, certainly give you the floor. I also want to follow up on a story. Yesterday, we talked to Kat Lantain from bloodwatch.org uh, talking about the pay to donate. Alberta getting rid of its voluntary blood donation legislation. We heard from a guest that was on the show last week, a former provincial minister, former progressive conservative leadership candidate, Dr. Richard Starkey, reached out to us yesterday. I so appreciate him viewing the show. By the way, give him a little shout out, as we will from time to time with our Patreon supporters. The Good Doctor is a Patreon supporter, and we appreciate that. He contributes a little bit every month to make sure that we can continue to expand uh, our depth of coverage and the quality of coverage that we provide to you. You can find those details at ryanjesperson.com. Dr. Starkey said, as a matter of fact, he said there are some things people need to consider. He said, not everything in your interview yesterday about Canadian blood services and blood donations and plasma was accurate, at least not based on his experience in government. And so I want to read that. We always want to make sure that we're following up on stories. We're getting different perspectives so that we and you don't look ignorant when you're talking to other people. We want to make sure that we have the accurate information so that you with confidence can form your opinions and communicate those with the people you care about. So that's coming up in just a little bit. But right now we have an opportunity to check in with a compelling individual. Victoria Love is a friend of Real Talk. She reached out to us just a few days ago, letting us know that she's been building, she's been essentially gathering an online community in an attempt to address in meaningful fashion Canada's crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And it's a real pleasure to welcome to the program Real Talker Victoria Love. Welcome to the show and thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, Victoria, I was, uh, I was sifting through your TikTok and, uh, and we're going to talk about how you're using your platform. If people want to follow you, uh, they, can, they can make sure that they follow you at Stories of the Stolen. Uh, but yesterday you were saying, you said, I'm, I'm doing an interview with Jesperson tomorrow. And you said, what do you think, guys? Should I wear this ball cap? And I noticed you're not <laughs> you're not wearing the ball cap. Uh, the, what, I know. What, what, what did the ball? What does the ball cap say across it? And, and, and why didn't you wear it? Uh, it says you are on native land. Um, I don't know. I just don't want to be like too much i guess no hey listen <laughs> i that, don't know no that's there, there's no such thing as as too much because the only thing that we do on this show is keep it real and uh <laughs> and, that, and that's exactly what you're doing so so let's acknowledge i think that both you and i are if i, under, I i'm not exactly sure where you're from please correct me if i'm wrong but i think that that both of us are, are speaking here on treaty six territory is that correct Correct. Yeah. So there you are. So we so so we are on native land, and I'm really grateful uh, that you're here with us today. Let's take us into TikTok. I'm just I'm fascinated by what it is. I'm fascinated by the growth of the platform. You have built a following of more than ten thousand people that are that are keeping a keen eye on your citizen journalism as you tell the stories of, for the most part, women and girls, uh, indigenous women and girls that have gone missing or that have been killed. How did this all begin? with you victoria where did this where did this start so basically at the beginning of the pandemic i was bored like everyone else and a lot of people got a tiktok during the beginning of the pandemic because it kind of blew up um and then from there what i how it all started was i um i posted a video just about amber tuckero i know she was a missing and murdered indigenous woman from Edmonton slash Little Duke area. I just made a video on Amber because I've always been fascinated with crime and um, especially Amber's case. I don't know why, but I just made a video on Amber and people started 
watching it and I was like I didn't think people would actually see this um and then people it just went from there people would message me saying hey I have a family member who is missing I have a family member who is murdered um I have a friend who was murdered or I'm just interested in this case like would you be able to talk about it and I was like I mean I guess like I'm I have like a thousand followers right now and I didn't really think people would see any of this so it's kind of surreal like i have never done anything like this before well i've <laughs> ever since you i'm so grateful you reached out to the show you sent us an email talk at ryanjesperson.com like anybody can and and i went I, i'm honest i dropped everything i was doing when you reached out and and you're you're, you're quite uh you're quite modest in your presentation or in your pitch. You say, Hey guys, I'm not sure if you'd be interested, but I'm doing this thing and I've built a bit of a following. And I went and I went, Oh my gosh. And the engagement on your posts and the number of people that are moved by what you're doing. And the, and the fact that you're now crowdfunding to hire a private investigator to help a family uh, try to find some closure or at least some answers with regards to the disappearance of their loved one, I think is just remarkable. Are you able to identify what it was about your storytelling, I'm going to call it citizen journalism because that's what it is. Um, what is it, do you think, that's resonating with so many people that has thousands and thousands and thousands of people watching your videos and following you? Is, is it the fact that, that tragically, really not a lot of people are talking about this, at least not as much as we should be? I mean, I think that could be absolutely it. It's a lot of the comments I get are people saying like, wow, I'm from Edmonton and I've never heard of this. Or... I do some cases like across Canada as well, like Saskatchewan and Manitoba, like, oh my gosh, this is my hometown and I've never heard of this. Um, and I think another thing as well is that people, when I started talking about it, people were saying, finally, someone's talking about this um, because yeah, no one talks about it. And like, there is a list on CBC of, over a thousand missing and murdered indigenous people and people don't even know anything about it. So Victoria, what, what sort of feedback have you received from people? You mentioned that families of missing or murdered women have reached out to you. That, that to me must be uh, for lack of almost a sacred experience, like a very moving experience. You, you talk about Amber Tuckrow and, and I've, I've interviewed both her brother and her mom and in speaking, uh, what I'm going to say is obvious, in speaking with bereaved family members, especially family members that lost a loved one under such horrific circumstances, a disappearance, a brutal killing, uh, the, the body abandoned, not discovered by police for, for, for two years, uh, a public apology in, in Amber Tuckerow's case, a public apology from the RCMP, which the family to this date, uh, or at least until August when I last spoke with her mom, the family has not accepted the apology. There's no closure. These families are, are are twisted up and tied up and bound in grief. What does that mean to you when families or, or friends of these missing women are reaching out to you? I mean, like, when it was first starting, I was really overwhelmed. And I was hearing all these stories of people who were basically trying to do whatever they can to get justice for their family member. And... Um, it's just crazy that they would have to message someone like me on TikTok for to feel like they're being heard or something. Um, so when people message me with their stories more and more and how I reached out to Priscilla, Caitlin Potts' mother, who we're doing the fundraiser with, every day that like I hear another story or I hear more information from Priscilla, like it's just I'm so grateful to be able to be included in this and I'm so grateful that people trust me with their stories and trust me to report it correctly and trust that I'll do what I can to make a video. But yeah, I get a lot of requests and it's just overwhelming. Sometimes I have to take a couple of days for just to clear my head because yeah. of how much bad things I'm hearing about the world that people aren't even talking about. Uh, you, you touch on something that is so important. Uh, the, the, the mental health implications of, I mean, you know, I, I think of people that are case files. I think of social workers. I think of journalists. I think of citizen journalists like yourself, crisis counselors. I mean, the, the, the amount of, of heaviness 
that people carry as a result of this is is not negligible and it's something you need to pay attention to. You're obviously channeling what you're doing in a remarkable direction. Let me read some comments. This is what people are saying live about your work right now, Victor. I mean, people are saying Laurel says um, some of the most impactful content on TikTok is from indigenous creators. I didn't even ask. Are you are you indigenous yourself, Victoria? I am white. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Laurel saying some of the most impactful content on TikTok is from indigenous creators. Uh, she says this is a, a, a great story. Um, Fatima is watching. Says Victoria bringing much needed attention to this topic. Uh, Two Beaver is watching this morning. Says I have so much faith in the youth, especially the one that we see here uh, today. Um, Leah, how about how about this? I mean, Leah, this is this is I think what this I hope is music to your ears, my friend says, I have to own a certain level of ignorance on this topic. I was aware, but maybe not really completely understanding what's been happening. Thank you for reminding me to pay better attention to what is happening. That's big. Yeah. 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 How did how did Caitlin Potts get on your radar? This this story in particular, what resonated? You, did, you didn't know her personally, correct? No, I have no connection with Caitlin or Priscilla personally. I don't have a connection with any of the cases that I talk about other than just knowing about them. But what happened with Caitlin was once I started, because like I started doing mostly just like Edmonton crime, but then once I started doing more Western Canada and throughout the prairies and such, I would get more and more requests of people from all over Canada. So a lot of people messaged me about Caitlin Potts and said, can you tell her story? And one of her friends reached out to me and a lot of just random people who wanted to hear me tell the story. So I looked into her case and I was, it was, it's just insane. And um, not to mention that three, four other missing women went missing from the area within a 20 month span within 75 kilometers of each other and a lot of people don't even know about it but yeah what happened with caitlin is i just made a video about her i actually made like a five-part video about it and um after that it got a lot of attention and the fact of the other missing women i was like something needs to be done about this because obviously something's going on here and I feel like it's too coincidental for it to just be random so the more information I got about Caitlin and the more love I got on her video and how many people requested for me to talk about it I was like I need to do something more so I reached out to Priscilla Potts her mother on Facebook I just sent her a message saying because like out throughout all of this I was like I know I need to do something more for someone and I just reached out to Priscilla and I was like, um, I would like, I heard about your daughter. I do this on TikTok. I know it doesn't really mean anything. Like at least like I'm not. You, stop official, saying that. But stop saying that. I know. It I mean, know. Can you, I just mean like. Sorry to interrupt you, but like I just, I hope you, I hope you recognize like people are, people are, our comments are going nuts right now. I mean, you, you are inspired. You're, you're, you're giving people perspective checks. You're encouraging people. You're, 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 you're causing people to look inside themselves and ask why they have not been more engaged in this story. Quite obviously, if I might say, you know, police would bristle at this and say, Ryan, it's not technically evidence, but there is evidence, there is anecdotal evidence that there is at Absolutely. least one or more than one serial killer. Uh, essentially preying on women in Western Canada, uh, in particular yeah. Northern Alberta and Northern BC. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I want you to continue your thought, no but worries. but but you are you're a remarkable person. I just need to keep saying that. Thank you, thank you so much. And I guess I just mean like I'm nothing official, like I'm not a reporter or anything. But I just reached out to her saying, um, I want to do something more from you. Uh, I've made videos about Caitlin and people have seen them and I was wondering like can we start a fundraiser for you to hire a private investigator because there's too much happening that police just sweep it under the rug like RCMP never told the public until 20 days after she was reported missing that she was missing you're talking about and Caitlin Potts yes and that's such a pattern with missing and murdered Indigenous women is when they're reported missing. It's not taken as seriously as to say if I was went missing. So 
I think that's just an important thing about it is I wanted to get someone as a outside perspective who isn't really associated with police to look into the case and see if there's anything more we can find. So Victoria, how did that, when, when you reached out to Priscilla Potts, who, who is a grieving mother, uh, I'm not sure that anybody on planet earth, not that it's a competition in the most tragic sense, but I don't know if anybody on planet earth hurts more than a parent that has lost their child. Um, and, and I'm not sure how Priscilla felt about the status of the investigation into her daughter's disappearance, but, but what did, when, when you essentially cold called her, she didn't expect you. She didn't yeah. know you. She didn't know. How did she respond to your offer to raise money to hire an investigator to look into her daughter's disappearance? I mean, I went about it as like lightly as I could, because obviously it's an extremely sensitive subject and I didn't want to like ambush her in her DMs being like, I want to do this for you. So I came at her like, I heard about your daughter. I'm terribly sorry. And like, if you're interested or if this is something you want to do, because like everyone grieves differently. So maybe she was in a good, she could have been in a good place right now and say, Hey, that's not something I want to do right now, or I'm not ready or something like that. So I went at it as lightly as I could. And she was amazing. She responded and was like, she told me that I gave her hope again. So I, she said, yeah, she was interested and she wants justice for her daughter and she needs closure. And the more we talked, she said that I gave her hope again. And yeah. What does that mean to you? What is that? How how does that, how's that, when you say that, when you repeat that to us and our audience, uh, by the time this is all said and done and the podcast is downloaded and YouTube is, is a week old, tens of thousands will have heard this or watched this interview. What does it mean to you to say that to an audience that size? It means everything to me. Like, I just can't believe that I'm here. Like I never really, I never expected people to care because like that's how it felt when I first started is that people don't care or people don't know or police don't care so I don't know like Priscilla giving me the chance to work with her to organize things and to hopefully find closure for her and find her daughter it just it means everything to me it's the most meaningful thing that's ever happened in my life so uh, Lisa says, thank you, Victoria. What you're doing is incredible. Heather says, thank you for doing this work. Carolina says, uh, you're a beautiful person, Victoria. Thank you for doing this. Um, I, I mean, you know, I mean, let Megan says every legendary reporter and, and, and so-called official person, you know, everybody put it this way, everybody with a blue check mark started somewhere. That's basically what Megan is saying. Yeah. Every verified storyteller started somewhere. She, she, Megan says, don't sell yourself short. What you're doing is incredible and it means the world. Um, you, you know, uh, Scott, this is amazing, Scott. So I was talking to my wife about you last night and, and we were watching cause my wife is the one that's saying to me, well, sometimes she's like, Ryan, you got to get on TikTok, And sometimes she's like, Ryan, stay off TikTok. But, but she, she's my window into TikTok, and we were watching your videos and we were moved yesterday and we both made the observation that Scott makes too. And he says, your TikTok content reminds him of watching that show unsolved mysteries, Uh, when he was a kid, and he says it means that you are giving these mysteries mainstream eyeballs, uh, which is huge. And the power, the the reach that people have right now. I mean, you know, look what you're doing. Or look what we are doing, Victoria. We're talking talking about a messaging platform that you are using to put the story of missing and murdered women on the public's radar, and we're talking about it in an interview – on an independent platform, live streaming on YouTube, we're understanding, we're coming to an understanding of, of what the, the future of new media looks like and the power of storytelling. And you are one of these powerful storytellers and it's remarkable. Let's make sure that people know about your GoFundMe. Let's make sure that people, the people that want to, 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 to respond to this in meaningful fashion, they can uh, go to GoFundMe and simply search find Caitlin Potts. And ultimately this is hundred percent of the proceeds are going towards a PI. You said, correct? Yeah, if I could say a couple words about it. Um, Caitlin was, so Caitlin was from Samson Creek First Nation, which is like an hour south of Edmonton. Um, She has a son. She was 27 years old when she went missing, but she did go missing from Enderby, British Columbia, which is in the North Okanagan. 
Um, but she does have ties to Edmonton. She does have ties to Alberta. Her mother lives in Calgary. Um, she has been missing since February 22nd, 2016. So four years, over four years. Um, so Priscilla did some of her own searches with Indigenous groups. And they go to Enderby every year when the snow melts to look for her, basically. Oh. Um, I know. It's, yeah. Um, they couldn't go this year because of COVID and such. But, um, yeah, the reason I started the fundraiser is because the team's helping Priscilla. Priscilla and her family and I agree that the police aren't doing enough and I don't believe the investigation was thorough enough and I don't feel like it was taken seriously um, because 20 days after she was reported missing is when they made it public, which the first 48 hours of any missing person's case is the most crucial. Yeah. Um, so the GoFundMe is basically to raise money for a private investigator to look into the case and do whatever they can to find more evidence. And obviously our main goal is to find Caitlin, but anything helps. Um, yeah. Um, right now we have $850. I'll, our goal excuse me, is 5000 but basically the deposit for a private investigator is 5000 Okay. So okay. I, I didn't want to make the goal like an extravagant number, but yeah. Well, I just, I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's just an absolute, uh, it's a weird wor word to use to say it's a pleasure to connect with you and meet you in the context of the heaviness of what we're talking about, but you're, you're just a remarkable person. Um, and I'm, Thank and, you and so I, much. I'm excited to see what you're going to do. Uh, moving forward, like have you Michael's watching, he says this young lady is an exceptional Albertan that from Michael who's watching us live right now. Is this I, I don't know what you do for, for work, Victoria, or what your aspirations may be or has has this experience on TikTok? I mean, you've got you've got 10,000 followers now, which is just the start. Um, I hope that you had a couple thousand more after this interview. Um, are, are, are you considering I mean, is this maybe changing what your future goals or, or plans might look like with regards to I don't know, a career in journalism or or ramping this up in a certain direction or or channeling this momentum into something further? Honestly, people have. So basically, I'm unemployed. I lost my job in March and I haven't had a job since before I was working at a grocery store as a cashier. So my plans I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing with my life, to be honest, but um, I think it could change my future a lot. And you giving me this opportunity means a lot to me. And um, a lot of people have asked me to make a YouTube channel or start a podcast or something. So I think that might be my next step. But I mean, I would look into maybe like a journalist doing a course for journalism or something. Because... Yeah. Well, you know what? I mean, Hey, some of the, some of the great journalists, uh, you don't, you don't necessarily, I mean, school's great. You don't necessarily even need it. If, if I think if you're a storyteller and you're compelling in what you do and you have a following and you're credible and, 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 uh, you, you operate with integrity, uh, you know, the schooling is, is I, I don't mean to discount it, but it's not necessary. And let me say this from personal experience, the barrier to entry, on starting a podcast is so much smaller than you might think it is. Uh, you know, okay. I, I I remember Scott Russell's this this CBC. Uh, he's a CBC sports personality, and back in the day when I was putting myself through school and I was bartending, Scott Russell would come in and he'd sit at the bar every once in a while. So I'd always pick his brain. Wouldn't want to bug him, but I knew I wanted to be a journalist myself. And and he had just put out a book uh, about hockey, and I said, "What's the secret to becoming a great writer?" And he and he looked up from his lunch and he said, "Start writing." Like, yeah. like it's not, yeah. you know, what's the secret to, to being a great podcaster, great storyteller, start telling stories. And that's exactly what you're already doing. And, and it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I just wanted to come on here and talk about the case and what we're doing. And I'm just hoping that we can hit our end goal and hire P a PI and find closure for Priscilla and I'm getting notifications on my phone right now of good donations coming in and people following me and thank you so much. Hey, listen, thank you. And I know this isn't going to be the last time that we're going to talk. Uh, it could be the beginning of a beautiful Sounds friendship. Uh, we're, we're all about people like you that make a difference in their communities. Victoria Love, thank you for joining us today. 
Thank you so much for thank you. Yeah, you you can follow uh, Victoria on TikTok at Stories of the Stolen, and again the GoFundMe there. Uh, basically, you can simply search um, the name of the GoFundMe, the, the fundraiser that she's uh, that she's raising money for the Potts family. Caitlin Potts, obviously. Uh, oh, can you can you walk? You can't walk a mile in those family shoes unless you've. Unless you've experienced it and you don't wish that on anybody to, to make the most obvious statement of all. Uh, just remarkable uh, citizen action there from Victoria. Uh, and, and, and her modesty to me is one of the most remarkable parts about this. Uh, we're grateful for the support of our partners that allow us to keep the lights on here, that allow us to grow this journey, that allow us to provide a platform for stories like that to be told. And that includes the team at Clean Air Club. Uh, we asked them to audit our space, as you know, here in the studio. You know, you open up a new location in person in the middle of a pandemic. You want to make sure that you're taking every possible step you can to be safe. So they took a look at our space they gave us the recommendation and then we said well what should we be talking to real talkers about they said the number one thing is the furnace filter if you want to breathe easy in your home you got to make sure you're changing it on a regular basis and if you haven't been changing it if you pull it out right now it's easy to pull out most furnaces you're going to look at it and and well you're going to get you know don't let that be the case sign up today at cleanairclub.ca they drop off your furnace filters at your front door they make sure they keep you on track and your family of course can breathe easy while you save money at cleanairclub.ca we're also so grateful for the team at local waste for more than 25 years they've been in the waste management game garbage recycling from small business all the way up to the big guys the grocery stores the malls and they're looking to expand their business with both their partners and their geographical reach. That's right. If you see a, an opportunity in your community, Chris Labossier is asking you to call him. Yeah, refer to him by his first name. That's what you get when you talk to local businesses. You can get in touch with Local Waste online, of course. They love to talk trash at localwaste.ca or give them a shout at 780-242-9746. Now, we promised we'd leave you some time to get into our Y Station polling results. Yesterday, we showed you what more than 4,300 of you had to say in answering our question of the week. You just go to ryanjesperson.com. It's right on the top bar of the website, question of the week. And we had asked you how you felt about the UCP vacation scandal and where your trust was at with government. Now, we had more than 300,000 words submitted. When we say let her rip, like tell us how you feel about this travel scandal. And several several of you reached out yesterday and said, we said we saw all the statistics, but you didn't spend much time. Um, but I have Bonnie and Lance both written down here as ones I wanted to recognize by name because I appreciated your emails to us. Uh, you can get in touch at talk at ryanjesperson.com. Lance in particular said, I was hoping to kind of, I was kind of hoping Hoping to hear my comment read. Now we did have forty three hundred of you respond, and and, and more than uh, well, uh, the, let's say the lion's share of you also added here in the comments section. So let me get to this. We wanted to put this in front of you so you get a sense of where people were at. Uh, someone who goes to Hawaii every year can not possibly know or has forgotten what it feels like to have lost a job, to be forced to use a food bank, or to not afford school supplies for their children. That was one comment that jumped out at us. Another said to lead is to sacrifice. Another said my Baba missed her first Christmas uh, with our family in 91 years. She was confined to a 12 by 12 room in her long-term care center. She spent her time trying to peek out her door, uh, talking on the phone, waiting for her bath, which was missed due to a staffing shortage. A listener says I probably should have just flown her to Hawaii for what could have been one of her last Christmases. Another said this reeks of Redford era entitlement. Another says I was literally sitting at my mom's deathbed listening to the premier's New Year's Day press conference. I guess you can probably tell how I feel about the travel. Another says two years in court and we successfully got custody for our first Christmas. We canceled because it required interprovincial travel. The UCP staffers and elected officials leaving the province was the most blatant evidence of informed arrogance one will find in recent politics. This Real Talk viewer said, my 13-year-old son, after a seven-year fight, passed away last year. The funeral was just my spouse and I. I haven't been able to see my parents and my sister, and we've not properly grieved, I continue to stay home to support another sibling who struggles with, a, struggles with a complex, rare disease. I cannot move forward with my life if I am forced to stand still. Another says, this speaks to the complete disconnect of elected officials to the people they serve. 
And another says, in retrospect, I probably should have just hugged my parents this Christmas instead of drawing a line down the middle of our backyard. Those are just a few of the comments that you left, the more than 4,300 of you that responded to our question of the week. This week, we take a look at what happened in the United States on January 6th, the day that will live in infamy, the, the attempted coup of Capitol Hill. We take a look at the federal political landscape and if, if, if Trudeau grinds your gears, if O'Toole grinds your gears, if, if another federal politician grinds your gears, you're not happy with the state of politics. It might be the interprovincial dynamic that you don't like. It might be politics within your province of residence, or heck, it might be your city council that's really turning you off. The nastiness, the nepotism, whatever it is. So our question this week, how do we as citizens stop the decline in the overall quality of politics? We want to know what you think about that. You can find the question at ryanjesperson.ca. It's open right now, ready to go. And of course, we'll be bringing you those results on next Monday's show. We thank you for tuning in today. We thank our guests that joined us. The time has absolutely flown today. Make sure that you... Tell somebody that you know that might love this show. We're getting emails from people saying, Jesperson, we finally found you. Where have you been? If somebody used to listen to the old show and you think they'd love this one, make sure you tell them about our website. And thanks for everybody subscribing on YouTube and to our podcast. Make it a great Tuesday. We'll talk soon.